<laughs> and we're live. We took over Beast TV. <laughs> How about that? Hey, y'all. <laughs> Hello, everybody in the chat. I saw y'all. I just couldn't really uh, uh, comment. We were trying to work out some some difficulties behind the scenes and everything. How Sounds is totally everybody easy. doing tonight? <laughs> what are you laughing at? I wasn't I said talking. You don't to you. know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'm doing. I know what my part is here. Oh, we'll anyway. See. <laughs> hush, hush. Don't jinx me right off the get-go. Mm. What is everybody doing on Thursday night? I guess Mark and Larry are in the woods, and they asked Misty and I if we could fill in for them this Thursday. And, of course, we said we could, and then we panicked for about two days trying to find a guest. And then we pulled a damn cat out of the bag, and... I guess y'all saw the title and we don't really need to introduce this man. So we will just bring him out if that's okay with everybody. I got to tell you though, you know, I was talking to Greg when you sent me the text about who was coming on. I cussed you. <laughs> that's only because you knew you were going to get nervous. Whenever he said, right. yeah, I was like, I, I was like, holy cow. Talking to Greg about getting him to come on. I'm like, Greg, you got to get with Kumbo and get him to come on Thursday. <laughs> I and was you like, Mark, me and I said, he better not have got him. <laughs> I was like, Mark and Larry going to be impressed. I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> but it ain't got nothing to do with me. It's got to do with this man, Mr. Tim Coombone Baker. How you doing, Coombone? Hey. I'm doing great. Finer the frog hair split four ways. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty damn fine. What? <laughs> What is that backdrop you got going on there? You look like you're in a redneck bomb shelter. <laughs> yes. You got it. <laughs> I am in. I am in uh, the world's famous Greg House Studios. Wait, wait. This this Greg House. This yeah, Greg, Greg House. House. That's Greg. exactly where we are. <laughs> Greg, you have Kumbo Baker at your house. Oh man, yeah. He's got his own key. <laughs> Because y'all were right in the same neck of the woods, ain't you? How far away do you live? You don't live that far. Oh, I'm, we're about an hour and 10 minutes apart at a slow drive. Or right. about 45, 50 minutes away if you drive like you mean it. Now, how far away are both y'all from, like, Bankhead National Forest? You're not that far from that either, are you? Uh, Greg is... Uh, He's uh his property borders Bankhead, and I'm about as a crow flies about 25 miles from it. Huh. A lot of yeah. activity reported in Bankhead. Absolutely. Well, let me ask y'all a question, Greg. You can probably take it off mute if you're sitting far enough away. It's probably not going to feed back anymore. Um, if y'all are that close. Now, I know that a couple other people here lately have been having a uh, kind of activity happening around them, especially in the past month and everything. Uh, is this like a, is it an all year thing where y'all are? Is there certain seasons of the year that stuff pops off? What do you think? Well, I mean, for me. It, it could be any time, pretty much, I think, for Tim, too. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. that. One of the things, you'll have to mute your Greg, I think. Yep. One of the things I learned back in the 1970s uh, from a guy who was a mailman out on the north side of the backhead was that these uh, boogers migrate. And uh, at different times of the year, and they they come out of the forest. A lot of the ones that are in the north part of the forest in the Sipsi Wilderness area and such. They come out of the forest in uh, around the first part of October before bow season starts, and they migrate to the north along the Town Creek watershed until they get down to the Tennessee River, and then they spread out up and down the river. And they hang out there. Um, what are y'all doing? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, they 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 spread out up and down the Tennessee River, 
and some of them end up on our farm, which is on the river. And they hang around there until uh, around the first part of April, and then they migrate back up to Town Creek uh, watershed back into Bankhead. And I know here where Greg lives on the south side of Bankhead, I know I've I've gotten evidence over the years that some of the ones here, they migrate <laughs> from the south down into the Black Warrior uh, watershed. Yeah. And uh, the lower parts of the, of the you know, Sipsy and Smith Lake watershed or, you know, downstream from Smith Lake. But, um, but we have a few that hang around year round. And the interesting thing is that all of the ones that, uh, here in the south part of, of Bankhead and the north part of Bankhead and the ones that are, that stay on our farm year round and the ones that come and go seasonally, they're all type ones or the patty type. They're not the, uh, there's, I've never seen one of the type twos or more like, you know, like the Neanderthal type, like we have primarily over in Mississippi and other parts of Alabama. Um, but they've been doing this every year. And, you know, we sort of get to know the ones that, that come and go, you know, by, like there's one that hangs out on the farm, you know, from the fall through the winter into the early spring. We've sort of named him Odin because he's got only one good eye. And that's how we, you know, can recognize him quickly is if we can ever catch him in a light, uh, one eye reflects white and the other eye reflects red. Uh, huh. And I've, I've seen him, you know, quite a few times. Uh, and he hadn't seen him since around the first week of April. And I don't expect to see him back till sometime in October. But there's something that's that's moved in there in their place that has made his presence known, uh, which we can talk about later. But, uh, uh, but that's I don't of, like I don't like where this is going. <laughs> but, I know. You know. <laughs> and I think, Greg, don't you have a sort of similar thing happen here? You got a few that hang around here all year and others that come and go seasonally. Yeah, I get a lot of reports on other areas that, you know, during the wintertime that people will see stuff and hear stuff a lot. And then kind of in summertime, they'll they'll kind of phase out and it's different times. But now here, I may have something, like I said, at any time. I mean, it, we've had stuff here year round, but now the majority of the stuff that we have is, is usually in the fall through the winter. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's not really uncommon to have something here about any time. You know, uh, number one, how many boogers you got down there if the mailman is coming up to you telling you about them? I mean, that's saying something right there. But we had a guy on this past uh, Sunday, Joe Parker, and he made a comment where he was saying that he kind of theorized that some of the ones that hang out around this campground, it's a, it's a heavily populated campground area. He was saying that he wondered if they haven't to a degree become kind of urbanized or almost domesticated where they were just used to the people coming in there. And because it was a constant food source, they would pull back and then, you know, come back in or come out at night or come back in whenever the people left and everything. But you get, you get mixed uh, signals talking to people. A lot of people you hear the thing where they come in <laughs> that speak of the devil, where they come in seasonally. And a lot of people seem to have them on the land all throughout the year. It's just kind of weird how it's different in different areas like that, you know? Don't they, everybody uh, talk all of this. <laughs> well, um, uh, jumping back a little bit to this mail to this mailman, he uh, he was the best researcher, probably one of the best researchers I've ever been around ever. That absolutely would never have considered himself a researcher. I mean, but I learned so much from this guy that back in the seventies, you know, when he was telling me this stuff. In, in very early 80s, 
a lot of it I didn't really believe, or I thought, huh, are you sure? But over the years, I've learned that every, every single thing he told me was, was right on the money. And, uh, and we can talk about some more of those, more of those things uh, a little later. But uh, I learned a terrific amount from that man that helped me immensely as I learned more and, you know, and became a more serious researcher. Um, that guy, he was a all or most or a large part Choctaw Indian, and he just had a uh, he had a very innate observational sense, and um, and I'm sure he had learned a lot from his you know his ancestors and everything, just like I learned a pretty good amount from my grandmother and my great grandmother. And, and, you know, from my, my dad, a little bit, some from my grandfather, one of my grandfathers, but, um, but we do have a, at least one troop of them that stays around our farm all year. Whereas, uh, like I said, during the fall and through the winter and into the, uh, early into the spring, you know, we have quite a few more, but, uh. Um, anyway, you know, I heard you tell a story one time about, well, not a story, but an experience about a cave on your property. I think it was something correct. about bats and they put a, a gate around that. And that was your family yeah. property, right? That is correct. Yeah. We still have it. Yeah. We've got a quite large cave that is a, uh, maternity cave for the endangered a uh, little brown bat and they come out and uh, do a population survey twice a year where they set up a bunch of equipment and, and uh, capture them and count them as they're coming, as they're leaving the cave in the evening and coming back in the morning. And uh, they, because they found evidence of people getting in the cave and shooting at the, at the bats with Roman candles and stuff like that, they talked my dad into letting them build a fence around the cave. And so they got the cave, got the thing finished and uh, they closed the gate and latched it. And they wanted my dad to put a lock on it. So my, they gave the lock to my dad and he went over there the next morning to uh, put the lock on the gate. And the fence was torn all to pieces. It was pulled down and very obvious that something very, very heavy had had pulled it down and sort of and mashed it down to the ground. Well, back then I weighed over 300 pounds and another friend of mine that was even heavier than me, we jumped up on another part of the fence and both of us pulling together couldn't budge it. Mm. Uh, so they uh, actually, I'm going backwards. What they found was that something had grabbed a hold of the. Uh, when my dad went back that next morning, they found that something had grabbed a hold of the heavy, heavy nine gauge chain link fencing and pulled it up from the ground and gone under it. So they came back in there and they redid the fence, and this time they dug a trench and put about a foot of the fence into the trench and then poured concrete in there to hold it all together and then laid rebar in there also. So again, my dad went over there to close the gate and latch it and put a lock on it. Came back the next day, and this is when the fence was pulled down from the top. And they had put a kickers up on the top like you see in your security fences around installations. And had four strands of barbed wire up up on the top, up above the uh, the eight foot chain link. And like I said, something had just gotten a hold of it and pulled the fence down. Mm -hmm. And myself and another big guy jumped up there and grabbed a hold of the top of it, and we couldn't budge it. And so they pretty much said, "What well, the heck with it? Whatever it is, it's coming and going. We'll just let them." keep doing it 
And what was left of the fence was a good enough deterrent to keep people out of there. Plus, they had a lot of signs. They put signs up on it, you know, saying keep out and stuff like that. Right. Uh, the fence has since been torn up quite a bit. But uh, you can still see that there's a, a fair amount of traffic, non-human traffic in and out of it. Um, they're talking about reworking the fence sometime soon. Uh, the, uh, but I firmly believe, and you know, we all believe, and even my father believed it, that you know that when they put that fence up there, that they either locked some of them out that wanted in, or locked some of them in that wanted out, <laughs> and that's how come the fence fence got torn up. Uh, now, now there's a big. <laughs> there's been a big tree pushed down onto the fence, that, which has knocked part of it down. And the trunk of that tree is worn slick with something coming and going back and forth through the fence uh, on that walking on that tree trunk. So, have you ever seen any other signs that would indicate that they are uh, inhabiting a cave? I mean, are caves like a yes. big thing? Yes. Uh, I used to be part of the. Was was a member of the National Speleological Society, which is a, the National Cave Ex Exploration Group, and we were in a cave up in northeast Alabama, and we were trying to. We had found uh, up at the top of a big cave in. You, we could see into another large room, and three of us were up there, and we were digging and pulling rocks away, trying to make a big enough of a hole to get into that section. I was on the left. There was another guy in the middle, another guy on the right. And the way I was working, my headlamp was pointed more to the right because I was trying to pull the stuff away that the guy in the middle was, was breaking loose and, and pulling back. And the guy that was to his right his light was, he was looking more towards the left. And we had a gap about six inches high that where we could see into this other fairly large room. And um, all of a sudden, the guy on the right started raising cane and hollering, you know, look at that, look, 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 you know, like that. And I turned my head to the to the left, and my light shined right on a couple of big old hairy feet. Really? I'm talking about big hairy feet. I'm talking about 19, 20 inches. And the guy in the middle, his light went there. And all three of us, um, you know, we said some choice words. And, I still don't know how I got down off of that rock pile. <laughs> All three of us. The next thing, next memory, memory I have is I'm down at the bottom of that big rock pile, and we're trying to decide who's going to go first because we had a, a pretty tight place to get through <laughs> to get out of there. Yeah, right. And uh, somehow we didn't, we didn't. Uh, uh, we didn't fight over it. All I knew is I didn't want to be last. <laughs> hey, and, that's uh, what I tell you. <laughs> so we got out of there and I haven't been back. So I have seen at least the feet of a booger in a cave. So. Uh, Where did Greg go? Uh, he's right here. He didn't go <laughs> anywhere. Well, you. He said he'll be right back. <laughs> You've been over to Greg's property a couple times. Does he have does he have any indications of caves on his property? Uh I don't think so, do you, Greg? You got any caves on your property? Yeah, there's one behind my mom and dad's house, and I've got a big blow up. I've got a bunch of rock shelters a small cave behind my mom and dad's house. You ever seen any booger evidence around that little cave? He said he's got a bunch of uh. He said he's got a bunch of rock shelters 
around here, and I imagine that they do definitely would hang out in those. But he said the yeah. cave behind his mom and dad's house is small, and he's never seen any, any, uh, you know, Bigfoot evidence around there. And Sherry Renault has said, "Do Coombo and Greg ever get the owl oh, sounds from them?" Absolutely, absolutely we, we do. do. We absolutely <laughs> do. Yeah. Um, the way, the way you, know, you know whether, whether it's, it's uh, uh, real, real or not, not is uh, when it's a true owl, they'll always put a trill on the end of their call. You know? Right. And when they when you hear owl calls that don't have a trill on it or are out of sync, you know, sort of out of time and don't have a, a trill on the end of it, that's usually a booger imitating an owl. And uh, I'm not saying that all owl calls with no trill are for sure booger calls, but there's a pretty good chance that they are. Right. Uh, and uh, a lot of times you'll hear a call that's uh, it's just not uh, it's not timed like like it should be. Uh, but I learned you know I learned about the booger calls at a at a early age. And the first time I ever tried to call one uh, by imitating an owl, uh, I was successful. And that was in 1968. That's how long I've been messing with these things. Actually, you know, I, I saw my first one. I wasn't four years old. And, uh, but we were, uh, we were fishing up in a place called Coffee Slough, uh, which is on the Tennessee River downstream from Florence and we were up there bass fishing and heard one way up the, the slough holler and uh, and it the call came from an area near a large cave called we used to call it Coffee Cave and uh, it's got a different name now I think but um, anyway um I told Daddy, I said, hey, I'm going to answer it back. He said, go ahead. So I cut loose with my best imitation of a, or an attempted imitation of an, of an owl. It was, it was real pitiful. <laughs> In fact, I told Daddy, I said, that wasn't very good, was it? He said, no, oh, son. <laughs> but all of a sudden, the thing answered us. And I said, I'm going to holler back. He said, go ahead. And I hollered back at it. This time, I, I hit it. And, uh, I had learned how to call like that from some game warden friends of mine. And uh, anyway, uh, and the thing answered back pretty quickly this time. And we could tell it sounded like he was closer. And uh, and I answered it back. And all of a sudden we realized it was bearing down on us fast. And Coffee Slough is pretty shallow. Most of it is not over waist deep. There is an old creek bed, a fairly narrow creek bed. It's seven to nine feet right down, that winds down the middle of it. But it's not very wide. It's not but about maybe 10, 15 feet wide. And my dad, I noticed about this time, that my dad was on the trolling motor and he was trolling us out towards the middle. Now think about this. Water that's waist deep on us is not much more than a, you know, knee deep on a on a booger. Right. Probably probably about knee deep. And this thing was bearing down on us and hollering and I'd only I'd only yelled back maybe three times, three, four times at the most. This thing was closing fast. Saw so my dad back then trolling motors. This is nineteen sixty eight. They didn't have the 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 little roller dial to increase your speed like they do now. Right. They only had high, medium and low. Daddy reached down and he flipped that dude up on high. And that thing was still gaining on us. And my dad says, son, hop down there and uh, crank up the big motor and get us out of here. <laughs> and so I did. And uh, I said, well, where do I go? Because this place is full of stumps. It's, it's, a, it's a cypress bayou is what it is. And dad said, he said, you just head right towards those cypress trees out there and I'll tell you where to turn. And I got on it. He said, get her up on plane. He said, get us out of here. <laughs> and I mashed down on it. And my dad told me which way to go. And we went hauling butt out of there. We ran downstream about a mile or so. And, 
and uh, we started fishing at a different place. And we heard that thing squalling and hollering and carrying on for a while up there. But uh, that was obviously that was the first time anybody had ever messed with it, and it didn't like it. Um, but that's uh, that's you know that's one of those little clues that let me know that my dad knew a whole lot more about them than he'd ever let on about. Probably. And, uh, yeah. But, I, uh, but before you answer that question, l- let me ask you, whenever you were hollering at it, did you do alcohol the whole time? Were you doing I did. alcohol? I did. Did, it, did it yell back with alcohols or was it doing its no. typical scream? No, it was doing just a typical scream, but, I knew enough at that time that uh, even back in 1968, I had learned enough about them. I left the trill off the end, ah, which which led it to think that it was another booger, right? Somebody encroaching on its territory, and uh, and it. Now there's a call of a uh, a variety of an owl call that. This sounds a little crude, but I call it the piss off call. <laughs> and uh, that, that we use sometimes if we know one's out there and he's hanging up, we can't get a reaction out of him. I'll do it. And a lot of times that'll get him moving or hollering or something. But I'm not going to share that because no. <laughs> I don't want somebody getting out there because we've had some pretty bad results doing it. I mean, good results, but bad incidents. Right. You know. Right. Uh, did, did you see that last question? Uh, I don't. Where'd it go, Misty? Where's what's the worst? Yeah, the best and worst experience. The worst experience. I've had several worst ones, but uh, one of the ones that just always comes up when I get to thinking about that is the only time I've ever gotten run out of a place that we went into that we were going to spend the night there. And this was in a cabin in a conservation area in southeastern Oklahoma. We went into a friend of mine, one of my early research partners, grandfather, had a had a cabin in the McCurtain County Conservation Area out north of Broken Bow. And we went over there. Uh, he'd been over visiting the grand, his grandfather who lived over towards... Uh, like near Gene Autry or Ada or something. He lived west of there, about an hour's drive. And we decided we were going to go spend the night there at that cabin. And uh, so we went over there, and I was utterly astounded. My friend knew the way to get in there. Cause, man, you get back. we got back in there. and uh, I can't remember the name of that little Hoochie Town or Hokey Town or something like that. And when we went through there. Hoochie Town, what, what were you looking for? <laughs> Uh, that's the name Where of the place. I promise you. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, we, uh, uh, anyway, we, <laughs> we, we went first. through that place. And once we left that place, we saw no signs of civilization <laughs> for, for miles. We twisted and turned and wandered around in there. And, uh, we, uh, yeah, that's that, whatever that name was, it popped up there. But, <laughs> We uh we we wandered around in there, and I got thinking. He, my buddy, didn't know where in the world he was, and he'd pull up to. We'd come up to a T. He'd say, he'd sit there. Oh, let me think now. I think I turn left here, and he'd turn left. He wander around. We come up. And say, oh yeah, I remember this. Yeah, we we go this way, you know. And finally, we wandered around after a while, and my golly, we can't, we got to it. And if y'all have ever seen the movie Exists, yes. This reminded me of that cabin in that movie. And we got out and we went up there. And now this was in the 1980s, early 80s. and uh, No, late 80s, excuse me. And we we pulled up and got out. And uh, we went up there and there was was power at the house. We didn't have to crank a generator or anything. But he... He flipped on the breakers, and there was actually like a street light out in the yard that came on when you flipped the breakers on. And 
and but we had to go down under the place and turn on the well pump and uh down through the basement and uh anyhow yeah that's what greg's doing <laughs> but uh anyway so we uh, we brought our sleeping bags in and just put the sleeping bags up on top of the bed the beds that were already in there and uh we had we'd eaten dinner before we got there and and we had a couple of beers with us and so we went out we drug a couple of rocking chairs out of the house out onto the porch and we were just sitting there in a rocking chairs and it's about ten thirty at night and uh and we just sat out there in those rocking chairs on the porch uh drinking us a beer and directly we well, yeah, that's one of them good southern words directly which means after a while directly we realized that man it was quiet as they say in the movies too quiet i mean there was no no night noises no bugs no nothing and this was uh in the summertime and uh uh Actually, it's about this time of the year when there's already bugs and stuff out. And we uh, we sat there. Now, my friend had had an experience, and I don't remember if it happened to him or his brother at that house when he was a boy. They were out playing in the yards, catching lightning bugs and stuff like that, and it got dark, and uh, it was time for bed, and his uh, grandma called him to come in and you had to go up about eight wooden steps to get up onto the porch and these steps these steps were open steps there wasn't any boards in the back on the back of the step right and the as you were approaching the house the right end of the porch was about six or seven feet above the ground one of the other of them it was either my friend or his brother we're going up the steps. Something reached out. A hairy arm reached out from between those two steps and grabbed one of them by the ankle. Uh-uh. And as you can imagine, it was quite a rodeo there for a few seconds. Yeah. And I think the grandfather, if I remember correctly, started jumping up and down on, on the porch, you know, making, you know, loud booming, banging noises with his feet on the porch and it turned him loose and the booger shot out the, that right end of the from under the right end of the porch hauling butt into the woods and the two boys went flying into the house and I can't even imagine what that would have been like. Right. I think it must have happened to my friend's brother because I can't imagine that happening to my friend and ever wanting to go back there Again, it's been the night just, you know, more or less by himself. So, we're sitting on the porch, and it's quiet. Both of us got the heebie-jeebies. So, we decided we'd sit out there long enough. And so, we got our butts in the house and went ahead and went to bed. I woke up at about 1, 1.30 a.m. And, man, my skin was crawling. And I felt like I was in danger. Now, we had the door closed and locked. We had the blinds were all down in the house. Couldn't hear a thing. But the more I laid there, uh, the more scared I got. And the only weapon we had between the two of us was my friend had his uh, Smith & Wesson 41 Magnum. And I noticed that I didn't hear my friend breathing like he was asleep. So I said, hey, you awake? He said, yeah. I said, man, I'm creeped out. He says, I've been creeped out. He said, my skin is crawling like crazy. And I said, well, what are we going to do? He said, I think we need to pack our stuff up and get the hell out of here. I said, I agree. So we got up, we packed, we got our stuff all packed up. It had taken us two trips coming in there to bring in all of our crap. We decided that we we were both so scared we weren't going to do it in two trips. We were going to try to do it in one. So I was the strongest one of the two. So I 
we fixed it so I could sort of sort of pick it all up, you know, and carry it like this. And my friend, I think I might have had a, I had a little 380. I forgot about that. I had a little uh, Sig 380. And so I had that in one hand, in my hand, in my right hand. And my friend got behind me and he had that 41 mag pulled. He held on to my, my back belt loop. And we, we went down. I think only one of us had a flashlight and it wasn't much of a flashlight back then. We got all the lights turned out. We eased out onto the porch. He got the door locked. We go down the steps and he sort of guided me. I couldn't really see where I was going, but he guided me towards the car and he covered our back. We threw all our stuff in the car, trunk of the car, slammed the trunk shut and hauled butt. We left McCurtain County Conservation Area. And we headed, somehow he got us out of Oklahoma and into Arkansas, but we were still in the Washita Mountains, which are just as spooky as that. We didn't stop till we got to Hot Springs, Arkansas. And that's a long way. <laughs> but that's, that's the only time I've ever been run out of a place that we intended to camp in or spend the night in. Just and, the creep vibe was so strong. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. Go. We could not stay there. Uh, and I mean, I got chili bumps all over me right now just talking about it. When we came out on that porch, that car was probably a hundred feet away. I didn't know if we were going to make it. Truly did not. And, that, that that was it was crazy. Do do you think it do you think it was a booger? You think it was something else? I think it was a booger or a dog man. I don't know. But uh, uh oh my gosh! I stop. do I I do know about that. Uh, actually, the dates are sort of messed up. It was a family that was killed in the eighties. The bow hunter was killed in the nineties. Or possibly the, the very late eighties, very early nineties. Um, you were the first uh, person I had ever heard tell the story about the family or the bow hunter. And you mm -hmm. know, you see a lot of comments. A lot of people talk about LBL, and I've been to LBL several times. I like LBL. To me, LBL is not nearly as creepy as a lot of people make it out to sound. Correct, but you you're somewhat of a authority on the the dog man things that happened there a lot yeah. of people have not heard about the bow hunter thing do you want to talk about that do you want to touch on that real quick all right well i i got it i got it straight firsthand from one of the one of the two rangers that were first on the scene that monday morning when the bow hunter hadn't come in like uh, like he was expected to. Uh, the wife had called the park headquarters and said that you know her husband didn't didn't come home and would they go check on him. And so they gave a description of his vehicle, which was a white Nissan pickup. And one of the rangers sitting there and said, Yeah, I know where that guy's camped. Yeah, I know exactly where he's he said, come on and he called my friend and and they uh, off they went, and they. Uh, now this is a different friend from the one, the incident in Oklahoma. So off they go, and they went there. And when they pulled up, first thing they saw was his tent torn all to pieces, and his sleeping bag was out on the ground and was slashed to pieces. And then they found the bow not too far away, um, uh, broken found the uh, quiver of arrows nearby. There was an arrow that had been pulled out of the quiver, but it was laying on the ground. Did not have any blood or anything on it. Uh, they found a dragway. Uh, 
they found blood, you know, a bunch of blood and stuff like that on the ground. Then they found a dragway, followed it for over a mile down into a hollow, and they found his body. Um, my friend told me they found his body, partially consumed body, up in a tree in his clothes nearby in the field, in a small little field. Um, I know when I was down, I was down there just within a couple of three, just very few, less than six months after this happened. You could still see where the road that went down into there was torn all to pieces. It had so much traffic on it from, you know, all kind of government people and stuff and investigators and things. In fact, the road, the normal road that you went down into that area, into that hollow on, was torn up so bad it was impassable for normal vehicles. When we went down there, we had to take a long way around, go much further north and cut back to the east and then angle back to the south. But he took me and showed me right where they found the body, where he said they found the body and where they found his clothes. Um. There's been a lot of people that have changed that story and stuff, but yeah, I got it firsthand from one of the two guys that was there. Uh, he also, after that, he told me about, now he wasn't there when the family was killed back in 82 or 83, but he took me up there and walked me through it because he said, but the reason he knew so much about it, because when this bow hunter was killed they drug out the files from when the family was killed he actually saw the the files and a bunch of the pictures and stuff and they tried to determine they did determine that it was the person was that bow hunter was killed by the same thing that killed the family you know some years earlier and not the same individual animal but the same type, right. in which was a dog man he took me down there and showed me the tree where they found the little girl, showed me the site where the RV was sitting. And you could still clearly see where the site was and exactly how it was laid out and everything. Now there's been so much stuff removed. You could, at that time, you could kick the leaves, you know, back and you, there was, you could still expose the gravel where the RV was, where the RV site was, you know, spot yeah. was. There were still pipes in the ground at the at the corners of the RV spot. Uh, you can still see remnants of the power system down there in the in the water system that was there when that when that RV campground was open. But uh, so even though he wasn't there when that happened, he saw the original files and. And was was actually back on the site with some of the at least one of the officers that was there that when they found the little girl. And uh, it's uh, I know it affected me when we went down there. I, I for a long time I couldn't even talk about it, but uh, but uh. I know these dog men are out there. The, the first two official reports I ever took back in 1978 were dog men sightings, but I didn't know dog men existed. And uh, I wrote them down as, as Bigfoot sightings. In 1984, I finally found, I finally got irrefutable evidence of the existence of dog men. And, uh, and I, went back and re-interviewed the people that I could find from those first two sighting reports that I took back in 1978, which, by the way, are only about five miles east of our farm. And when I went back to re-interview them, I remember the guy said, well, we tried to tell you what it was and you wouldn't listen. <laughs> and he was right. I had no idea of the existence of dog men. 
and I wrote the report up based on my knowledge base at the time. That's why anybody that's listened to me has heard me say that any researcher worth their salt, that's worth a flip, has got to be able to go back and reevaluate their their evidence and their reports and and reevaluate all of it and change be willing to change what they wrote up way back yonder, you know, to to update it, to correct it based on the latest experience and the latest knowledge and data. And so, uh, I mean, I've had to do that with quite a number of reports over the years that uh, where I had to change, uh, you know, what what my original evaluation was. I know there was one that it kept coming up, coming up, coming up, coming up over a period of 30-something years. Uh, and I kept writing, uh, improbable, doubtful, needs more corroborating evidence. I, I would write on it every time it'd come up. Right. And lo and behold, about <laughs> four years ago, out of the blue, I stumbled across somebody that had who was the daughter of one of the people that one of the wardens that investigated an incident that happened in Colorado and um, and she knew all about it she knew all the details and so there's no way that she could have been making it up and you know, she knew things that I had never revealed and um, and it solved what one of my research buddies from the first time he ever heard it, he believed it. I didn't. But um, anyway. I, I, I want you to know that I stopped listening somewhere around the bow hunters thing because I don't want to know nothing about this. And you're one of my heroes in the Bigfoot world. And hearing you say that you have irrefutable proof of this, that's just too much for me. Well, I do. Too, too much. Because he doesn't want to know about it, but I do. And I'm kind of wondering, can, I mean, would you mind to talk about the differences that you find between them that let you know that that's the difference? Well, like, I don't like reveal, it, I don't reveal you know. everything, but because um, I have to have, I have to keep a oh, few things right. close to the chest right. so, so that I can tell when somebody's BSing me or telling the truth. Right. right. And, uh, one of the things I've seen happen a lot is somebody will have an encounter with a Bigfoot or a dog man and they give a, an honest, factual report of what happened. But then they get a little notoriety and they start embellishing it and and then they start coming up with all this other stuff. Then, then I know that that's you know, not, not the truth. However... I still keep their original reports and because, you know, they would have revealed something that there's no way that they could have known unless they were actually there and experienced it. Right. Um, but uh, Michael X says this, that was that where the hunter in Colorado shot one and then another pulled the hunter's head off, head off. And that is correct. And he, he not only yanked his head off, he yanked off both of his arms. It, and possibly one of his legs. Was that the uh, one with the guide where the guide yes. took him out there and the gun jammed? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yep. That's that's a good one right there. Yeah. I finally got I got irrefutable evidence or, or reports from the daughter of one of the game wardens that investigated it that was there on site. And she knew all of the details. She knew stuff that I had that the guide had told me that I had never shared with anybody else. And uh, I was absolutely flabbergasted. <laughs> and what was crazy, she was a friend of a friend that was from out there. And she was visiting. And this friend knew that, you know, knew that I was into Bigfoot and knew that that lady was, and she, Invited herself over to the house for supper. 
I said, sure, come on, you know. But we, uh, well, I didn't know that we were going to be end up talking about Bigfoot and about this incident around the dinner table. I had no idea. Uh, and I bet your but, jaw about hit the table when you realized what she was talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I can tell you this, they looked high and low for that particular booger and never found it. They looked high and low for the body of the one that uh, that the guy shot. And they found, again, evidence that that one had been carried away by others, but, uh, but they never found it. Um, Would, do you remember, do you remember the incident with the hunter that was going to meet his wife after work and he was sighting in a rifle? I Very found, well. I found, uh, roughly that location. And yeah. that is just, that is just a really impressive story. And to a lot of people that have never heard that one, would you mind going over that one briefly? Okay. Um, this happened right on the, I, now I got this straight from, mm, I tell you, what, I better not reveal my source. <laughs> uh, it might shut me off in the future. <laughs> All right. I got this straight from an investigator that asked me to come up there and look the place over and see if what they thought was plausible. What happened was there was um, a man and his wife and the wife's brother that were going to go deer hunting one afternoon. The husband had to work that day, and he hadn't sighted his rifle in. So the, the wife and, the, and the, her brother were going to go off and hunt um, out of their stands to the east of there. His stand was not quite as far east as theirs. But he said, all right, when I get off, he said, I'm going to take all my stuff to work with me. When I get off, I'm going to go by this gravel pit and I'm going to sight my rifle in. And his rifle was a Weatherby, 300 Weatherby Magnum, which is way overkill for deer. But, uh, I mean, this is something you could kill elk, moose, polar bears, you know, grizzly bears and stuff with. So, uh, but the gravel pit was close enough that they could hear him target practicing. So what happened was they're on their stand. They hear him shoot a couple of three times. And then they hear him shoot a couple of times pretty quick. And then they don't hear anything for about 10 minutes. Then they hear him rip off like three shots fast. Then they don't hear anything. So they're wondering, well, did he get one? Well, it got dark. They came out of the woods. And to the north, northeast of there, they had a hunting cabin. And did you find the cabin, Spencer? No. Okay. No. It's to the north, northeast of there. And so they went to his his stand, his uh, his tree stand or ladder stand, whatever. I think he had a permanent tree stand there. Didn't find him. Didn't see his truck. So they went back to the. Uh, uh, it was pretty dark, and so the the brother in law says, "Oh, uh, well, he told the wife, so why don't you go ahead and get supper started? I'll go down to the gravel pit. He might be stuck down there because it gets muddy, and they'd had some rain the day before." He might have just hunted there at the, around the gravel pit. So that's where he goes. When he pulls up and he shines his flat headlights down through there, he sees the guy's truck. So he said, well, and he must be stuck. So he didn't drive down there. He walked down there and he had a flashlight with him. When he gets close, he's shining around and all of a sudden he realizes he sees the guy inside the truck. And he said, well, he must be stuck. He must have fallen asleep, you know, waiting on us to come get him. Well, he gets a little closer, and all of a sudden he realizes the guy's feet 
are up behind his shoulders. Yeah. And pointing the opposite direction. And he's wedged down behind the steering wheel. And then he notices the guy's just got the crap beat out of him. And then he gets to it scared the heck out of him. He gets to looking around real fast, and he sees all these tracks on the ground. Barefooted tracks. Big barefooted tracks. And the roof of the truck is all bashed in. And the hood of the truck is all dented and bashed in. The guy backed out of there as fast as he could. And he calls the sheriff's department. Sheriff's department gets gets there. And they uh, they realized what was going on. They realized they were over their head. So they called in help. This place is right on the Kentucky-Tennessee state line. So federal authorities get involved in it. And it's right in the edge of the Daniel Boone National Forest. Again, so federal people got involved in it. What they reconstructed was they found where he had been, the target he had been shooting at. They found where he had been shooting from. They found that he was sitting there at the at his bench or whatever he was resting on shooting, and apparently a booger walked out on the high wall, the 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 north wall of this gravel pit, which was about thirty, eh, not that high, say twenty feet high, and it must have walked out there and screamed at him, because that's that's happens sometimes. I mean, that's not an uncommon thing to happen for somebody to get screamed at that's making a bunch of racket. In, the, in a booger's territory. Right. And apparently the booger screamed at him. The guy shot the booger. And the booger apparently ran. There was all kind of blood up there on top of the, uh, the high wall of the, of the pit, gravel pit. The guy apparently ran up the west wall of the thing, which started down low and then got higher and higher as he got to the north wall of the thing, which is the highest, deepest part of the gravel pit. And they found an area there at the northwest part of the of the gravel pit, just off the northwest, where there was uh, there were a bunch of several pieces of brass laying on the ground. There was an area of a lot of blood and stuff and hair. And then they found the gun torn apart. The stock busted, and it had looked like something they had taken it by the barrel and beat it against a tree and bent the barrel, and like I said, busted the stock all to pieces. And then they found where the guy had been carried or off the hill, folded in half backwards, jammed into his truck, in behind the steering wheel. Yeah. And then they found the tracks from, they're pretty sure at least five different individuals that then cavorted around the truck and jumped on the truck and ran around it and such and then left. They also found a big blood trail that went for a ways yeah. where the, the booger that the guy had shot had been drug away or carried away. And, the person that was had me there would not tell me what had happened to the booger if they found it or, or what. I couldn't get that. But I told them, I said, yeah, I said, they, they retaliate. That's why I tell people, don't ever, ever, ever shoot at one unless you want to fight the whole troop. That, and wherever that, there's one, there's always two or three more. That's what I have to keep telling Greg. Greg, yeah, yeah, got to keep telling Greg to stop shooting at him. Yeah, that, that's why he gets in so much trouble. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna shoot at him, dude. I, I thought I was gonna have to, but uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, before I got hooked up with my adopted brother over here, Mister Tal Bronco, done warned myself. He said, "Look, don't be shooting at him unless it's no other choice. Do not shoot at him." Now, I've had several times I thought I was going to have to shoot one because I didn't know what this was going to do. 
but all I've done was ever had to do was level a rifle down and they stopped. I'm talking about slammed on brakes and whoa. And I mean, now I've had, I'm not, y'all, anybody's heard me talk. I've had the times when I thought absolutely that I'm fixing to be the dude that's fixing to have to try to kill one. But at no point in my life did I want to be that guy. You you think you got problems with a broken ankle. Can you imagine being folded in half like a pretzel and stuffed behind your steering column? I, it, it'd take more than a couple months of rehabilitation on that one. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, when I went up there, it was a week after this incident happened. And there'd been a lot of people on that site. But you could still see the, the track, the, the prints that those things left in the ground around there when they were dancing and, and cavorting around his truck. Now, the the thing that popped into my head when I saw that and when I saw the pictures of the guy's truck, it reminded me of the Bowman story that Teddy Roosevelt told. Yeah. And when they killed those two those two hunters or maybe it was one that they killed where he said when Bauman said that they cavorted around his partner's body and when uh, and when they killed the boy and the girl there at Brown Springs, Oklahoma the FBI agent and the other guy, the photographer that took all the pictures they said that they had cavorted around that guy's car and cavorted around those bodies. Um, you know, danced danced around them. They, they sort of went crazy. You know, like sort of like you see chimpanzees do when they when they get excited, like a victory and, celebration. Right. Exactly. And people have no idea how strong these things are. Uh, even chimpanzees are known to yank people's arms off or tear people's face completely off. And we're talking a chimpanzee doesn't weigh much more than a, a, a lot of them don't even weigh as much as a normal man. But when we're talking about a 800 to a thousand pound creature, you know, it's nothing for them to, to rip a man's head off. And there are reports of this going all the way back into the 1820s. I mean, you wouldn't believe if you dig hard enough how many historical reports there are of of things like this happening and how quickly they can dismantle people. Uh, what, was, what was the one encounter? Was it in the Okefenokee Swamp? It was in the 1800s, I think it was, some yep. escaped slaves. It, yeah, it's the swamp that stra- it's the big swamp that straddles the Florida-Georgia state line. Yeah. I can't remember if that's the Okeechobee or Okefenokee, but um, I'm not that familiar with that area. But yeah, the uh, guy was he was a, he was a um, slave hunter that he that was his job was he hunted down and captured escaped slaves. He finally caught this one that he was looking for. He had six people with him. There were seven people after this uh, crew of seven after this. Um, uh, escaped slave the slave was glad to see him he started carrying on about this big monster or something i don't remember what his words were um that had was after him had been after him and i don't know if it happened right then i can't remember the exact timeline but at some point that night the thing showed up and charged into their camp. Now, remember, at this time, all they all they have are muzzleloaders. Uh, six of them, in fact, maybe all seven of them, opened up on this creature. Before it died, it ripped the heads off of six of them. And the description of the way it did it, the there was a good description in the article about how it did it, and it exactly, perfectly matched the way that guy told me that it in that, that booger ripped the guy's head off in Colorado. Yep, exactly, perfectly matched. And there is 
no way that that 21-year-old kid had ever seen or heard of that report from Florida from the 1820s. And, and stop it, squirrel. Uh, we we do not need a full fledged dog man show, people. We don't need it. It's not good for your psyche. Well, that, that, that guy that just put that question up there. <laughs> that, that guy that just put that question up there. That's a pretty shady character. I don't know. He about is. Him. He <laughs> is. We, we, we oh, now, Mark, Mark's one of my buds. <laughs> we should not allow comments from Mark Green anymore. <laughs> I got you, Mark. <laughs> He'll be talking about chitlins next. Fire ball. Uh, well, according to Mark, they're good both ways. I don't want uh, either one. Uh, creek washed or stump hooked? All I know is I've smelt them cooking one time, and that was enough. <laughs> we used to have some neighbors that, that every Thursday night, they had chitlins, and they boiled them. And, oh my God, they were awful. They lived <laughs> two ridges over from us, and I delivered the newspapers out there, and I had to deliver their paper, and I hated Thursdays. You know, <laughs> they would always be cooking those things. They'd make when I'd get up close to their house, I'd be gagging. Yeah, I mean, and boy, when, I, when I'd be delivering on a motorcycle, I, I'd be flying down through there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you 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 ate raccoon once, so I mean, chitlins yeah, ain't. <laughs> Dude, uh, no, yeah, raccoon's great. way better. I can make you some raccoon chili that you'd love. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You ate it by accident, didn't you? Uh, no, I I had an idea what it was, but even after I knew for sure what it was, I ate it anyway. It was good. What what's 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 your favorite barbecue, Kumba? What's your favorite type of food to have barbecue? Uh, just whatever's in front of me. No, right, pork, pork. <laughs> pulled pork, pork rib. I love ribs. I love pulled pork. I love bar I love barbecue chicken. And yeah, my dad could make the best beef ribs that I've ever eaten. I've never had anybody smoke beef ribs as good as my dad could. I love beef ribs. I try to get them to come out yeah. kind of like brisket. Uh, yeah. half the time you can, half the time you can't. Yeah. I guess it just depends on the actual animal. It's kind of like ribs. Sometimes you get a tough rack of ribs. Sometimes you get a good yeah. rack of ribs. It's just, what do yeah. you say? I one, love brisket. One slung chitlins. That's right. I, if I, if I, I, I could, I could choke them down fried, but, uh, <laughs> but I couldn't, uh, look at him, look at him. See, this is what happens. People get in my chat and and try to steer the show in a whole different direction. <laughs> Barbecue coon is good. Uh, uh, <laughs> I it take bad. on that one too. <laughs> I've had. I tell you something. It's nasty. As barbecue groundhog. Yeah, this stuff's greasy. It's nasty. I don't we want any groundhog. We had this discussion last yeah. night about groundhog. <laughs> and well, you did. know, you never have to one. Groundhogs eat <laughs> stuff. Know why they eat. don't eat them. <laughs> groundhogs eat stuff better than what cattle eat. You'd think they'd be good, but they're greasy, nasty. Yeah, man, they're awful. Uh, but, I, I'm but, probably going to steer away from that. But, uh, <laughs> what do you think? Well, what do you think? Do you think? Uh, do you think boogers are just opportunistic and that they eat pretty much anything whenever it gets slim oh, pickings yeah. as far as vegetation? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's how. That's yeah, absolutely. That's why they're becoming urbanized. I mean, I first heard about urban boogers in 1984 about the boogers that are, uh, uh, you know, that were coming into Troy, Alabama. And, uh, you know, raiding dumpsters and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, come on now. You got to be kidding me. And uh, so I started, I was working, you know, I was staying there while we had a NASA project going out northeast there. And um, <coughs> anyway, I, I started doing some pretty serious investigation. And lo and behold, I found it was actually the truth. I found all kind of evidence where they were following a creek that came right up under the new bypass, which is, that was put in back in the early 80s, uh, around the, the uh, south and be the west part of town. And 
I found all kind of tracks up and down the creeks. I found where they were coming up out of the creek bed, uh, hitting dumpsters around places like, you know, Wendy's and Taco Bell and stuff like that. And, and uh, I was utterly astounded. And not long after that, I was uh, working a job up in, uh, up in Chicago, of all places. Actually, it was in Aurora, Illinois, south of Chicago, and there was a guy that knew that I that worked there that that knew that I, you know, researched Bigfoot big time, and he's like, "Man, we got some of these things out here, and they call them forest preserves around in Chicago and in, in the suburb areas." He said, "We got boogers in the forest preserves." I said, "Oh, come on now!" No, I'm serious. And so he kept pestering me, and I, I. So one weekend I said, all right, let's go. Went out there and I was utterly astounded. First one we went into, I found a lot of evidence. We got screamed at. I went up in another one up outside of not far from Des Plaines, Illinois, a huge forest preserve or nature preserve, whatever they want to call it. And I did a couple of calls and I got answers back from two or three different places. Hmm. But I found them on Staten Island, New York, of all places. Uh, like I said, uh, all in and around Chicago and uh, Troy, Alabama, <laughs> uh, Farmington, New Mexico, uh, anywhere where there's adequate water and cover and a and a permanent food supply, they'll eat, they'll ease in there and sneak around. I found them. Unbelievable amounts of them running around up around Manchester, Tennessee, and uh, uh, and I can't remember what's the name of the other little Winchester, Tennessee area. And I mean, I I found them in in urban areas all over the place, and uh, a lot of these urban areas have these green belts they call them, and you know they'll have creeks that go through town. Hey, I. I found them in northwestern Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, running a little old feeder creek that goes down into the Chattahoochee River, and coming up in uh, some fancy neighborhoods. I just wonder how many cats and dogs go missing up around in there. Right. I just think it's funny because, you know, the average person thinks to go out looking in the middle of nowhere you know, miles and miles out, but there's right. quite a bit, there's quite a bit of accounts where it's right on the edge of, right. You know, uh, highly populated areas. It's, yeah. it's interesting. I it, mean, they're right in the city limits of Huntsville, Alabama. I, I never, <laughs> I never see reports though, for them being like spotted at like, uh, uh, what was Cam Buckner talking about in that one episode of Steve Lilly, where it was on the outside of like this giant uh, dump or this giant uh, metal complex, but like dumps, like landfills. Oh yeah, it's amazing you don't get more reports of them being like spotted around landfills. Because I mean, that's a all-you-can-eat buffet right there. Well, I bet I bet they're there, but they probably make sure to keep all that crap suppressed. And uh, uh, <laughs> that is fun, making a believer out of somebody. I've I've been lucky to be able to do that numbers of times. And uh, I remember my buddy Wade Parker lives down in Texas. His his friend Paul. We uh we were out in Oklahoma a couple of years ago and got to make a believer out of him. What was funny is there was three of them standing there across a little small body of water from us. <laughs> we could all see them. Of course, we knew what we were looking for. And, and we kept trying to point it out to Paul. And he couldn't see it. He couldn't see it. He couldn't see it. Finally, Wade grabbed out a, a green laser pointer <laughs> and put it right <laughs> over the thing's chest. And, of course, what was crazy, it glanced out real fast. And it, it, it went like that. And then it, man, and it dove into some cover, into some brush off beside it. And Paul got to see it because we had like two or three lights on it. And uh, <laughs> he, he was like, all of a sudden, his life changed. He's like, oh, I saw it, I saw it, I saw what he did. You know, he was carrying on. And uh, 
there used to be down on the Natchez Trace in one of the parks was the uh, the only booger that I've ever encountered that you could reliably call up in the daytime. And he would come and expose himself. I mean, I'm not saying expose himself like a <laughs> sex pervert, but I'm talking about he'd walk right out of the woods where you could see him. And, uh, Misty was taking notes. She was ready for you to give the location. <laughs> <laughs> they nicknamed that one helicopter. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Greg, don't get me laughed. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> this this place you could go, you could go down there and you could you could call, and it would and it would show up, you know. Uh, I never tried calling it any earlier than about three o'clock in the afternoon, but you know, you could call it in the later part of the afternoon while it was still good daylight and it, it'd show up, it'd walk right out and scream at you. And, uh, I made believers out of several people down there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I had a, had a German guy at the plant one time, and oh man, he was giving me fits. And uh, he would, we, he would, he'd come over from Germany to help us uh, rework some of the equipment in the in the in our plant. And uh, and they got to <laughs> tell, you know picking him, say, "Hey, go ask Baker about, go ask Baker about Bigfoot, about Sasquatch." You know, so he go there, and he started asking me some questions. So I started answering his questions. And, He's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he was basically thought I was a nut. And I said, I said, well, would would you like to see one? Well, yeah, we can do that, absolutely. And <laughs> and I said, if we can't see it, you can we can at least get yelled at. Well, I'd love to hear one. So I said, all right. About four o'clock that afternoon, we got truck and off we went. And uh, <laughs> we got there, and can you hear me good still? Mm -hmm. And anyway, we got there and got out. I listened around a little bit, nothing was going on, so I cut loose with, with a call. And that sucker immediately answered us back. And this is a place where they were coming and going under the trace through a culvert and he says and uh, and it started screaming and then I, I hollered again and here it came and it was getting closer and closer and he was saying oh it's going to come across the road right there i said no nah, it, it's going to go under the trace in this culvert you won't be able to see it but it'll pop up right over here somewhere around these picnic tables no it, that's not gonna happen and buddy about that time that thing cut loose and it was about 40, maybe 50 yards down the hill from us, standing right there by a picnic table. And this old boy had to come apart. <laughs> I, <laughs> thought he was, I thought he was going to soil his britches. <laughs> he, uh, and this is a big old boy. This is the Alpha. And uh, it was a Type 2, so he was only, you know, about eight and a half feet tall, something like that. But still, though, you know, he was a, very impressive. That sucker cut loose screaming at us, and I mean, it was, you know, rattling our teeth. It was so loud, and and uh, he he's over there trying to get in the truck, and the truck was locked. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to tear the, tear the handle off. I finally, I hit the, hit the remote and let him in, and he's ready to go home. <laughs> so, I got him out of there. The cool part about it is, is we had to drive right past it. And it was on his side of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he loved that. <laughs> oh, he did. He really loved it. <laughs> oh. He didn't doubt the Bigfoot stuff no more, did he? Oh, no. Oh, no. He did not. And uh, he, uh, but I got, nobody at the plant had ever had the guts to go down there with me. And I had, after that, I had a, a one or two guys wanted to go down there. But the, all the teasing came to an end. There was no no more teasing, and you know, pestering me about it after that. But uh, it, 
if you had to if you had to take a a new person out right now a, a new person that didn't know you didn't know who you were didn't know your experience or anything and let's say you weren't in your local area i got to ask this there's going to be a lot of people that want to know is there any pointers you can give as far as like uh trying to narrow down the spots that you go to because we we just talked about they could be right on the outskirts of like urban areas they could be out in the middle of the woods i mean what's some of the stuff other than just like looking up recent sightings on the bfro or whatever what's some of the stuff that you actually like look for to go i think this would be a good idea or a good spot well that's exactly what we do in a lot of places i look for a uh year-round water supply that would probably have uh, fish in it and that they would be good enough fish that, you know, that you could eat them. Uh, yeah. Even if it's stuff like carp. Um, I look for shelter, uh, you know, heavily forested areas or and it could, you know, it only has to be something like, uh, like a lot of times out, in, out west, all you'll find is a hedgerow or something, or a canyon or something with with brush and stuff growing in it. But I look for good shelter where they can get out of the weather, and where they can lay up, and people just walking through or riding through or whatever are not going to see them. I look for a. Uh, a fair amount of animals, you know, prey animals that they can catch. And that can be anything from cats and dogs to raccoons, possums, deer, hogs and calves and stuff like that that they can poach, um, uh, things like that. I look for places where they would have a good escape route if they had to get out of it quickly. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and I look for travel routes where they could move cross country. I also look, and, and I look over an area that's uh, where they can have about a, a 10 to 15 square mile area that they could move around in without uh, exposing themselves too much. Now, they will go across open country in the dark, uh, but but they like to be able to have, like, deep drainage ditches. Uh, one of the things I found in, like, in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, and place where you've got creeks and drainage ditches that have cut down deep into the ground, Missouri, yeah. where you've got these ditches and things that are eight, nine feet deep, they can travel through them even in the daylight, moving from place to place, and they're not going to be seen by people, you know, even farmers working the fields and stuff. Um, <clears throat> so you got to look for good water source, good cover, uh, good tra travel routes through an area. Uh, You know, hopefully, you know something that where they can, where they can take shelter from really bad weather, like, like, like Greg has here, uh, these uh, overhang, uh, yeah. what we call shelter bluffs or bluff shelters, bluffs. and yeah. or caves, or out in Oklahoma or other places we found where they will get down in one of these um, creek beds, and where you've got a a dirt or a clay bank, they'll actually dig their own place up under the bank. Up under, they'll find a tree or something that's growing close to the edge of the bank, and they'll dig up underneath it. And the roots and stuff that are hanging down over the front help sort of, will help to uh, camouflage it. Uh, I've heard Dan anyone, Ricky talk about that. That's right. Dan and I, Dan found the first one that I ever, that I ever saw. 
As far as I know, Dan, Ricky, and I are the first people in the world that's ever crawled up inside of one knowing what it was. But let me tell you, when you get up inside that thing and you can see their handprints and stuff and see where they actually scooped that dirt out with their hands, see their, their, where their fingers dug into that dirt, that, that, that does something to you. Yeah. And, you know, I got up in there and <laughs> I went in first and Dan's right behind me with a Winchester Model 70 chambered in 458 Winchester Magnum. So, That'll to do those it. of you that know what that don't know what that is, that is literally an elephant gun. That will stop a charging rhino. It'll stop a charging elephant in its tracks if you put the bullet in the right place. Dan was covering me with that 458 mag, and, and I eased up in there, and then Dan was right in behind me, and it was it was breathtaking. There was enough room up inside of this this shelter that they had dug in the side of this creek bank that you could probably gotten six or seven of those things in there easy. Hey, or now, maybe, maybe eight or nine or 10. I don't know if they got, if they packed themselves in, but it's pretty freaking amazing. And if you saw the, again, if you saw the movie exists, that's what I was going to ask about. All right. It was taller up and down than the one in the movie and it was not as long as the one in the movie but there were tree roots hanging down through the top of it there's part of the cave on our farm that's like that that that, that it's there's part of that thing and i don't know if, if they dug it out or what but it's close enough to the surface it's a branch of that cave on our farm where there are tree roots hanging down through the surface through the roof of the cave uh Hey, Patrick. But, uh, uh, yeah, Dan is, as far as I know, the first person that's ever found one of those and recognized what it was. And Dan is one more terrific researcher. Yep. He's like some of the other guys like Troy Allen and stuff. You don't hear about him a lot. They don't have much of a public presence, but they know as much as anybody or more than most. In fact, I'd say those two probably, as far as lifetime experiences with them, probably have had more than me. Tal Branco is, you know, is a good, Exist is a movie. It was done by the same people that did the Blair Witch Project. And there's several things in there that we contributed to the movie, but not, we didn't want to, uh, I didn't want my name associated with it, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what kind of arrangement was made, but in the very tail end credits of the movie, they mentioned Lauren Coleman. And I, I know that I know that the deal with the uh, with that shelter, with that lair, that came through Dan. Then the deal with the upside down tree with the Yep. Tree jammed down into the ground with the roots up in the air. That that came from some of us, and um, and the throwing of the bicycles and some of the other things. Uh, uh, I mean, there was a there was a lot of uh, uncredited contribution to that movie, but I, I don't I didn't want my name on any of it, and uh, I mean. It's definitely one of the better Bigfoot movies out there. Yes. Now, the, anybody that saw the Blair Witch Project knows that that was a low-budget movie and exists was a low-budget movie. So the booger that's in there is very low-budget and hokey-looking. But what he does and a lot of the reactions he has are, and a lot of the things that you see in the movie are pretty much uh, spot on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I miss Tal a lot. Uh, by the grace of God, I got to spend three days with that fella here about three, four, about four years ago, and uh, at his home, and uh, that was a that was a blessing. And he and I, the, 
I can't remember what who, whose show I did it on, but Tal asked me to do a show for him because he was in bad, such bad health he couldn't do it himself. So I did a show where I told about an incident that had happened to a law enforcement officer in Arkansas, and and then Tal went and investigated it and what happened to Tal there while investigating it. And it's when I finally, hearing it from Tal, he verified things that I had seen and heard of. And he and I just sat down and we shelled down the corn and realized that he and I had had a bunch of similar experiences in the field that we had never shared with anybody. And uh, I felt a real bond with him. And I I feel sorry that that I just I had never uh, that I hadn't spent more time with him. So uh, his but, his book his book is probably full of more actual legitimate information than probably ninety nine percent of the other books I've read on the subject. I would say I would say that's true. Because Tao was straight up, absolutely no embellishment anywhere. He and that man had cojones like nobody else that I know. I mean, I can't to hear him talk about the things that he has experienced alone by himself. Just uh, absolutely, just used to blow my mind. And to actually see the gear he used, be out there with him and stuff. And just totally astounded me that that, that, that old man <laughs> had the guts to do what he did. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know. I was introduced to him at a young age. And the first thing I ever laid eyes on that Boogers did was they tore apart uh, six dogs. I mean, just tore them to shreds that belonged to the folks that ran our sawmill on our farm. And uh, I, uh, you know, that affected me from a very, very, very young age. And after seeing that, I've always had a huge respect for them. And I didn't want to become like one of those dogs laying there with his head gone and his legs pulled off and his trunk of his body twisted in half, you know. And, you know, I found coyotes like that over the years, dogs like that. And uh, uh, I don't know, you know. I, somebody asked earlier what was one of the coolest things that I've ever experienced. Yep. Was... When I lived down in Mississippi, near uh, between the little town of New Site and Bay Springs Lake, there's a there's a bayou out there, and I lived on a little island uh, in this little bayou. And uh, there was only one other house out there, and that guy. He left early and came late. Came back, you know, late in the afternoon. He didn't believe in them, and the uh, only thing he knew is that he kept uh, every dog he ever got didn't last very long because he would he wouldn't let his dogs come in his house. Um. Anyway, I got to know the boogers there pretty well. At that time, I didn't know about the dangers of habituating them, so I used to leave them treats and stuff like that. I I had a stump back about 30, 40 yards back in the woods behind my house. I'd go back there and I'd leave them stuff. And, and I'd leave them things from colored pieces of different colored glass to mostly blue glass and Hot Wheels cars and feathers that I found, or things like that. Or I'd leave them leftovers and things. And they got where they watched me like a um, like a hawk. Every time I'd come out to go to work, I'd hear 
a whistle or a, a little hoot or something, and then down in the bottom in the bayou, there'd be an answer, usually a knock. Um, and I'd come home from work, and I'd get out of the truck, and I'd hear it again. And I got where I was, you know, calling at them a fair amount. And Mike Stuckey was a friend of mine, and Mike's another good researcher that's passed on. Mike specialized years ago at recording, doing really high-quality recordings. And he was up there staying with me uh, one week, and um, we uh, uh, David Hughes asked a question, who is Tao? It's that's Tal Branco. That is, that's Portuguese for Bill White. His name was Bill White, and I, but he did a lot of work overseas and down in Brazil where they speak Portuguese. So that was his screen name was Tal Branco. So anyway, uh, there was one that used to come up. There was an old tractor shed that was diagonal across the road from my, my house, and there was one that got where it would come up in that on the edge of that old tractor shed and. When I'd get home and I'd be out with the dogs, um, it would hoot or whistle at me, and I'd whistle or hoot back at it. Well, Mike was there, and i get home from work, and uh, Mike's been out somewhere doing some recordings and stuff. He comes driving up, and we got out, and it was dusky dark, and we were sitting there talking, and I heard from over around the, that tractor shed, I heard a, a little short owl hoot, and there was not a trill on the end of it, uh, so I knew it was the booger, so I called back to him with the same call and didn't put the trill on the end of it, and what was crazy, there was an owl in a tree nearby that answered, hmm. so I called again. And the booger called, and my and uh and the owl called, and Mike was recording this, and this goes on for a bit, and all of a sudden Mike starts fussing under his breath, and I says, "What?" He says, "My batteries are dead," and I got irritated at Mike. There was, we were getting one of the most awesome recordings ever. I mean, it would have been, it would have been absolutely astounding to have a recording of a booger, an owl, and then me, and the booger, and the owl, and me, just going around and around like that. That was a special moment, but Mike's batteries died. I got mad at Mike which I've, I've regretted. I've apologized to him. I can't tell you how many times. We got in the, in the truck. We hauled ass 20-something miles back to Boone, into Booneville, Mississippi. Went to the Walmart, bought a whole bunch of brand-new, fresh batteries. Went back out there. And, of course, by this time, the booger in the aisle are gone. But we went to a different area down in the uh, John Bell Williams management area and did some more fantastic recordings. And right there while I was holding my recorder in my hand, it died. <laughs> I had just put those batteries in there not 15, 20 minutes before. And uh but anyway. I've had that, I've had that happen. <laughs> yeah. That was a wonderful, special time though, when I think back about it. Uh that was absolutely astounding. The three of us sitting there doing these owl calls back and forth with, uh, you know, me, a real bo- a booger, and an owl. <laughs> that that was pretty cool. Great. And, oh, I'm sorry, Kumbo. Go ahead. No. Other I, other good thing that happened at that same place is I put a whole bunch of leftover, uh, like twenty five or thirty leftover uh, 
Subway sandwiches on a platter out on my front porch. And I came out the next morning. <laughs> There's a stack of onions right there and a stack of tomatoes <laughs> right there. And all the rest of the stuff of them is gone. <laughs> the other thing that was there was a skull of a dog. I looked at the really? skull and it was of a, a, the way the right upper canine was broken off. I knew that it was my neighbor's dog that had disappeared a year before. And because of the way the tooth was broken at a, at a weird angle. And uh, in fact, I showed it to my neighbor and it freaked him out. Uh, Almost that, like a thank was, you? Yeah, it was a thank you. Huh. And I've got I've got some round, smooth, some smooth, round, white, flat rocks that have been left on my porch and stuff as a thank you for things that I gave them. I'm serious. <laughs> that's that's crazy right there. But but again, you hear about it from so many people. Yeah. It's almost it's almost like there is a reciprocity between yeah. well, Greg. Greg's dad shot one and the deer got snatched. And then the next day it was laying in the middle of a field. So, I yeah. mean, it's, it's almost like a, like a paying a percentage or paying a ohms to where you get the thing from. So, right. right. Yeah. That the one that dad shot, it's in, it's actually in Tal's Tal Bronco's book. Uh, that's one of the encounters, you know, or one of the, the stories that's in his book was, yeah, it was, it was a couple of days later, but yeah, they, they'd flung that thing, the carcass back out of the wood line and you could see where it hit in the, in the dirt and rolled, but they, the hide, uh, Tim will tell you, you know, the way they done the hide on that deer was like what, what, uh, Bill White, Tal Bronco, what he said that they would do to dogs. And I've heard Tim say it, it was like they had grabbed it in the middle of the backbone and just pulled it each way and like split it, like pulled part of the hide over to the rump and part of the hide up on the neck is like they just yeah. tug a war and it split in the middle and just ripped it open and that's the way they had hold that deer out was they they like pulled it in the middle and pulled it two different ways and just jerked the hide off of it it was oh. crazy crazy yeah. i just listened to a uh, podcast yesterday they were talking about that the guy had shot a deer and said that it took it like it was going to take the whole thing and then it's like it stopped just literally grabbed it by the back legs and just divided the deer and threw half of it back to him and took off with half of it yeah my uh my great grandmother used to talk about um uh, when she was little and this is when they, she was still living she was probably half Cherokee, and they lived up uh, when she was a little girl up in the uh, extreme western North Carolina, not far from Grandfather Mountain, near a place called Seven Devils, which is now like a ski resort area. But yep. back when she was a girl, this was really seriously in the middle of nowhere, back country. And she talked about when they would go, when her dad and her brothers would go deer hunting, that uh, if they shot a deer and it got off into a certain area of the forest, they knew that that was the Nunyunui's area. And she called Bigfoot, she called him Nunyunui. And, um, and she said before they would go in there to recover that deer, that they would get one of their uh, holy men to come and they would do a ceremony uh, asking, you know, for permission and protection and everything to go in there. So they would go into the, in there, into the, into that part of the woods. When they found the deer, they would leave the heart and the kidneys and uh, the tongue. I think sometimes maybe the brain and a front shoulder. And uh, I think they left the lungs in there. But they would leave a significant portion of the deer as payment uh, 
for the, uh, you know, for the, uh, for coming into their property. And so, Greg, I've lost power to my computer. It says my battery's going low. Let me go figure out what's going on. All righty. Well, uh, well, we can, we can, we can go ahead, and I mean, we're we're at well, hang, two hours now. Hang on, Greg's uh, chasing it down. He's uh. Don't be trying to cut us off, Spencer. We're right in the middle. Uh, I'm, there I'm we not, go. But if we lose there your we go. power, I'll we'll lose him in the middle of the broadcast. <laughs> well, let, let me ask yeah. you a question, Kimbo. Do you think that stuff like that, do you, is there any chance in your mind, do you draw any correlation between, like, maybe ancient traditions that, like, possibly Native Americans had with boogers, you know, hundreds of years ago? Do you think that Booger oh, yeah. still like recognize some of those uh, traditions yeah. and and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, these things are not not they're just not ignorant animals. Uh oh. Now what? <laughs> my browser has lost connection to my camera. Make sure. Oh, wonderful! My <laughs> just... computer is installing updates. How nice. uh, Look at just, now. Did you hit the stop cam down at the bottom though? No. Uh, oh. Sorry. There, there, you go. there you go. I was trying to. Are we trying to myself. cut out on us now? <laughs> All right. Um, this is what's so aggravating. Here I used to be able to tear down and rework and any computer in the world just about. And you know, used to program a lot of the st stuff on the NASA flight computers and used to tear down and rework the, uh, uh, you know, the hard drives and stuff on the shuttle. And now I have to get my grandson to show me how to <laughs> use my cell phone. My right. seven-year-old grandson. <laughs> oh. I can't work a computer for nothing. So I, I wasn't a nice engineer either. Well, if it wasn't for Sandy, we wouldn't we wouldn't have this computer. I wouldn't be on this computer. Yes, yeah, Sandy saved and, uh, the day. Yes, she did. <laughs> and, uh, well, Sandy and Misty. I can't even get the chat's moving so fast I can't even get the Welcome yeah. to the tech talk at Woodwalker. <laughs> Look at no look at what Michael course. look what Michael. Yeah, we there. saw. <laughs> That's one uh, of our old uh, government saying. <laughs> we were, we, were, we had a we had a meeting and it was a bunch of us good old boys from down south and and we had just pulled off some absolutely amazing feat of engineering and we had some jerks from like Jet Propulsion Lab out in California or MIT or something there. And, wow, y'all did a really good job. I can't remember if it was Tracy or one of the guys said, yeah, we right on the foreskin of technology. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and meant it. Yeah. Oh, here comes Greg. He's wanting to get in on the foreskin. Is he, <laughs> is he, is he coming? Back? Yeah, I know, right? Say oh, anything look, I more. thought I was going to get ousted while I go for my comment to have him <laughs> over here laughing for 10 minutes. <laughs> no, no, no. And don't be stirring up too much stuff, Greg. We're trying to make we're trying to make at least one show look somewhat professional. Good luck. <laughs> it never works out that way. <laughs> we're, we're, we're filling we're filling in for Mark and Larry. So so we're trying to tone even our uh normal selves down some but that's why you know you done it on this channel <laughs> well that's why they wanted me to do it on this channel so i didn't that's ruin exactly theirs <laughs> yeah. that, that's why they made me start my own show <laughs> so they wouldn't be held accountable kumbo you're on mute buddy i said they do better than to turn us loose on their channel Unsupervised. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no one here. See, Mark, Mark's good at it. Mark has a way of breaking in and kind of walking the subject whatever way he wants. I don't. Yeah. 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 Uh, 
Uh, the Black Knight satellite, yes, satellite. it's real. Oh, and all the crap that they've known about it—that is ten thousand years old. And all that—that's that's a bunch of bull. All I know for sure is that the records that NASA's records of it start in nineteen thirty-eight, and it was actually, and it was from when the Germans first discovered it in nineteen thirty-eight. And uh, in fact, now. The U.S. government didn't know about it until the Germans told them, asked if we knew anything about it in sometime in the late 40s, like 48 or 49. And our government was like, what? <laughs> and, of course, back then it wasn't called the Black Knight Satellite. It was called something else. And and uh, it wasn't until they got it, got photographic evidence and of it that they started calling to the Black Knight satellite because it actually does look, a, from some angles, somewhat resembles the a Black Knight chess piece. But it's, um, and yeah, and this was, and this is in the d- days before humans had ever put anything into orbit. So this thing was just something that was up there holding a geostationary position at a low altitude, which consumes a enormous amount of energy. So, uh, anyway, that's all I where got to say about where, that. Where did it come so, from? Where did it come know. from? Don't know. Don't know. The Germans, the British discovered radar or figured out, invented radar. The Germans stole the design from the Brits and built their own. The British realized, hey, wow, we can we can see ships and we can see airplanes. The Germans, being the scientists that they were, or are, they said, wow, we can figure out how far it is from the Earth to the moon. Wow, we can see close asteroids that we didn't even know they were there. So they were playing around with it, looking around out in space and just happened to find the thing. Purely accidental. And huh. then they realized how close it was. And the Germans knew enough about uh, about space flight technology, even though we hadn't been in space or hadn't put anything into space, that they realized that for something to be hovering over a set spot over the Earth, surface of the Earth, at that altitude, and they could tell by that it was something of pretty good size and mass from the radar return they're getting, that something's burning a huge amount of energy to stay right there at that low altitude, you know, of only about a couple of hundred miles up, uh, that they knew, and they were wondering, oh my God, the United States got something up there? And the spy, their spies and everything figured out, no, the U.S. ain't got any idea about it. They said, well, did the Soviet, they were trying to figure out who's it, who it belonged to. Well, they eventually figured out it didn't belong to anybody on Earth or anybody that they knew on Earth. And that's where the records start is in 1938. And all this other crap that Nikolai Tesla and Samuel F.B. Morse and Alexander Bale and all that, that they detected it and all that, that's a bunch of garbage. But now, there's a slight chance that they could have <coughs> discovered some kind of anomaly, but those early guys, but I doubt it. But, you know, and then you look online, it's always been there for 10,000 or 11,000 years. That's a bunch of crap. How can anybody know that? It might have been here for 500,000 years, but how can you know that or prove that? You can't. All I know is that it showed up in 1938. They found it. And it has come and gone. When they looked around for it sometime in the late 40s, under the, the Germans told them what to do and how to look for it, they found it. And I know it's come and gone several times since then. And I know that one of the shuttle missions, uh, NORAD detected it. And called up 
and asked them to take a look at it. You know, get get cameras and everything ready because they were going to be passing close enough to it that they ought to be able to see it. And they did. They made a course correction once they got over the horizon from it where it, they couldn't be seen. And so the next orbit, they came up right on its butt and tried to get a lot closer to it. And it started moving away from them. So they attempted to keep up with it and couldn't. As they started gaining on a little bit, all of a sudden it made a 90 degree course collect correction, went flying off to the side at a vector that there that the shuttle it was absolutely impossible for the shuttle to do that maneuver. In fact, it was impossible for any known space flight vehicle to make that maneuver that it made, and it disappeared. And they didn't see it anymore during that mission. Now that's all I know about it, because that was the mission that I was working on. Now, I see people. I we've we've covered Bigfoot, Dogman, and UAPs <laughs> all in one show. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, somebody asked about Dogman later on or, uh, here, way back near the f first part of the show, and. I believe we're dealing with two different two different types of creatures there. I believe there's been a certain amount of dog men that's already been around that's always been here, like you know, from the get go, and that's where the old loot guru and the were werewolf stories and stuff come from. But I believe we we're also dealing with something that was created that's the result of some kind of genetic experiments. I do know this that the Soviets had a tremendous genetic engineering program going on. That's a fact. Yeah. Um, when the Soviet Union fell, they there were quite a few people that were dispatched into some of the satellite countries like Romania or Bulgaria to lay their hands on as much of that equipment and technology and uh, as they could, including live specimens. And I do know that there is a European country that has major loopholes in their laws that allow them to uh, carry on, continue carrying on a lot of that, those experiments uh, that are illegal in most other Western countries. Um, the, so... I mean, this is going way out in left field, way out in left field, admittedly. But mm -hmm. you hear a lot of people talk about uh, strange, strange anomalous occurrences around some of these things. Like, for example, the sound of like metal doors uh, opening and closing, the possibility of like underground structures that, that maybe they open a metal door and let these things out. LBL has been mentioned specifically by someone here in the past year. You think there's anything to that? You think there's some kind of top secret government program where maybe these things have been created in a lab or at least programmed in a lab to some degree and they are controlled experiment type things where they let these things out, some of them? It's a really good question. I know for a fact uh, there are at least two dumbs inland between the lake, deep underground military bases. Um, I have historical maps of LBL going back quite a ways. I can take you to where there used to be campsites and stuff. There used to be, uh, uh, you know, regular regular campsites that are now gated off, have very good roads going into them, paved roads where yeah. there used to be only gravel. They're gated off and there are new buildings built back behind these gates. Uh, 
I have watched over a period of years uh, things being built on LBL, entrances into underground facilities and such, air vents being put in, ventilation shafts you know, being put in, uh, entrances being put in large enough to drive semis into. And but then sponged out. Uh, myself and another gentleman have been watching this going on for decades. Uh, somebody was asking about the uh, earlier about the bunkers. Yeah, the bunk, the concrete bunkers at the north end of LBL were built during the Korean War for training purposes. They were torn up and destroyed back about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I think because there were so many people going in there messing around and they were worried about people getting hurt in there. Now, I don't know how they would get hurt. I don't know if the boogers were using them as a, as a shelter or maybe the dog men were using them as shelters, but... All of those bunkers have been destroyed. The roads going in, in there to them, you can't even find them anymore. They were they were they were cabled off, and then everything grew up around them. And you know the underbrush is very thick in there, and I can't even find how I used to get in there. I used to walk in there, and um, I can't even find how I used to come and go out of the place. But the last time I was in there, all of those bunkers had been busted up and uh, been rooted up out of the ground, been busted up into big chunks of concrete. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that I think that whole section where the family, uh, where the family was attacked, I think that whole section is chained off now. I don't know. I haven't been up there in a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, well, but the does, interesting uh, thing, you know, we took uh, the last time I was up in there, a lady showed up with some cadaver dogs. Yep. And I didn't know that cadaver dogs could hit, could find evidence of blood and stuff like that that was decades old. I, I didn't know that. I've since done some research and found out that they can. And those dogs hit right exactly where I had been shown where the different things happened, you know, where they found the boys, the, the father's body and the son's body. And they hit on the tree where they, where they found the little girl's body. Yeah. Uh, and the lady didn't know where it was. No. <laughs> I've, I, I've heard firsthand about that. Uh, that that's a yeah. freaky enough thing in and of itself. I mean, just the implications of that. Yeah. Yep. Do y'all have anything you want to touch on or wrap up before we jump off here, y'all? No, I don't think so. Just that I, when he got to talking about the dumbs, that's what I was telling you before I asked if you had ever heard of them. And... I mean, I've, I've, I've heard of I've heard of the underground bunkers. I've just never heard of them being referred to as that. Yeah, um, I've heard people saying that you know they they've watched semis literally drive into the side of a mountain, like like the mountain opened up to you know let oh, them, Lord, let them yes. go through. There's lots of places like that. Yeah. I, I was gonna say I, th I I'm pretty sure I know the location of one in Pennsylvania. Where, where they have all that, that the coal mining that used to be in there, a lot of that stuff, right? See, <laughs> but uh, I had a, I had a distant family relative that was contracted by the government and they used to do some of that strip mining and they were contracted to help build. I want to say it was part of like the, the secret, like underground things for like the presidential stuff, like in case of like a nuclear threat or whatever. They go underground, but I'm not positive. I, I don't remember any of the details about it, but there's some there's weird. A lot of, there's, 
there's a lot of military bases where there's more stuff underground than there is above ground. Really? Oh, Lord, yes. Oh, well, but I wouldn't know about it, but you can tell us all about it if you want to. Mm-hmm, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in a couple of them. <laughs> this, sh- this show's already going to get flagged. We're okay. <laughs> Spencer, yeah. Spencer yeah. we need to go ahead and get this out of the way right now. So, look, if you'll drag yourself all the way down here to North Alabama, come hang out with me. We're going to go ahead and get Tim committed that he's going to let you go up there and go in the cave. Now, I'll stand at the Ooh. outside real close to a vehicle, and I'll no, wait I on you, but I'm not going in there. No, I, w- I want you to go with me. I want you to go with me to Oklahoma, and you and I crawl in the little underground in the side of the creek thing way up in there where you can see fingerprints. But don't well, pull that, the trigger beside that, my head. because that, that, That's going to be a it. solid no. No. <laughs> no. So, so you just go ahead and mark and, the check box says no for Greg. And Greg means it. He's not hey, kidding. Me. He's like, no. I, I still can't figure out what possessed Dan and I to actually do that by ourselves. The, and, the, the booger <laughs> stuff, the booger stuff, I would try. I don't know why, but in my head, it doesn't freak me out like the dog man stuff. The dog man stuff is just, uh, I don't know. I cannot mentally, I don't have the capacity to deal with that. Don't want to know about it. Don't want to hear about it. No. Well, <laughs> see, I did I want to know. <laughs> you and Dan, but, but Dan, Dan also, though, Dan also, though, crawled. What was he doing? Like looking down and or he crawled through some tunnel and the people were yelling at him saying the things behind you or something like that. Uh, that was in the oh boy. Dan has more in the old, Indian, the old Indian school. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see how he. I don't see how he came out of that. Did, didn't didn't he crawl under the stage or something like that at that uh, school and they found uh, stuff in there? I, 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 well, let me tell you, one of the things that I that I was told that happened in there is this old school had a uh, had a had a physical plant. In other words, it had a steam plant where they piped steam through the uh, the campus of the school to heat the buildings and heat the dorms. And there are in the old streets. There's the manholes are still there. Somebody pulled open one of the manhole covers and tied a Sony video cam on the end of a rope and let it down. And this is a a sisal rope, so it's you know it's it's spiral, twisty. You know, it's old fashioned. They used that because they knew once they let it down, that as spin. the weight of the camera pulled on, that the camera would slowly spin around. And you know, and photograph and, and video everything that was in the tunnel. So they let it down, and it starts spinning. All of a sudden, wham! Something hits it. And it just blows to a thousand pieces. And that was the end of that. Yeah. I've, and, and now and this I've is been... a place. And now this is a place that Dan was then crawling around in, up yeah. underneath stuff and. Into some of the some of the mechanical spaces, what we call chases, where all these pipes come up and run out through the buildings. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. That's what that's what I was going to say. You have to I, stop Dan. You have to stop Dan from going in there. But then again, Dan hey. was will, Dan was willingly a pilot. So I mean, that's like Mark Newbill. Mark Newbill jumps out of perfectly good airplanes. There, it, it's not all well, clicking up here. Well, see, Dan <laughs> is one. Of, is also a crop duster. Yeah. One of the guys that flies under power lines. Yeah. <laughs> and through gaps in the trees and stuff like that. That's and he makes, and maneuver, he, makes maneuvers at, <laughs> he makes maneuvers at 50 yards above the ground that most pilots won't do unless they're like five or 6,000 feet up. And he misses it. He misses it. Wishes he could yeah. still do uh-huh. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 See? I've seen him. I've seen him flying in his plane. And that man was a hell of a pilot. Let me tell you, hard-headed German. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's what it takes. In order to find Bigfoot, you've got to be crazy. That's what it takes. Well, yeah. There's something wrong with all of us. Yeah, we ain't right. We've done established (laughs) this. (laughs) I mean, I've been hit by lightning twice. 
think Greg has. I, and, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, know. I didn't say I'm staying we, away from all right, of you all. You know? <laughs> we ain't right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the synaptic firing is off just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't been uh, here, but I don't want to take my well, chances. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of iffy with all of you. <laughs> uh, um, you know, anyway. it's, it's crazy. <laughs> well, uh, both y'all, thank you very much for doing the show tonight and saving my butt to, to give me to have somebody on the channel. Uh, well, I, I'm sure I'm sure everybody in in chat and everybody that will see this show is uh very happy to hear everything that we covered. It was it wasn't very well guided and we just went all over the place, but I thought it came off pretty good. And Kumbo, yeah. I know you got about I don't know, six months worth of interviews in you to cover all the stuff you've been through. So oh, if at any yeah. point if at any point you want to come back and do it again, we just got to get the microphone thing figured out so that Greg can do live commentary while you're talking. <laughs> that might not be safe. This this might have been this might have been a blessing in disguise. <laughs> Let me see here if I can turn this no, around. I can hear you fine. No, hey, I want you to say something here. Y'all oh, see? Okay. <laughs> Where's he? At? Let me see here. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? Hey, well, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> Wrap around view of the man cave right there. there you go. Wrap around view of the man cave. And yeah. and the man cave has had, I mean, you're actually at a spot right there where stuff has happened. I mean, I mean, I, both of y'all have had stuff. Look there. Cash you, cash you take it up for me. Look there. Yeah, that's not saying my friends is. <laughs> she wasn't. She wasn't necessarily taking up for you. Look at the. I, I'm taking that like I want to. I'm, I'm. I'm saying that was positive. But no, it, look, did let let Tim let him tell you about the the times he's been right here at my man cave and he's come spent the night night or two and I reckon every time you spent the night over here you've had something go on. Oh Lord, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, we uh. We were sitting here one night. Troy and I were in here, and uh, and man, I started getting heebie-jeebies, and and I knew which direction they were coming from. And Troy says, "There's a booger out yonder." I said, "Yep." And of course, about that time, Jake, my old police dog, my old German Shepherd, he had to go pee. And when he decides he's got to go pee. He will not, he just, he won't shut up. So, all right. So I stuck a pistol in my pocket, put him on his leash, and out we went. Jake goes right around there where the damn booger, where Troy and I both could feel that the booger was. Goes around here, puts his hackles all up, and he's standing there growling. Right by, right back past, behind Greg's LP tank. And... That's where you've had several incidents, isn't it, Greg? Yep. Yep. So, but one good thing about old Jake, he doesn't run off and leave me like old Bo would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me go ahead. Let me tell you something happened last week out at the farm. Uh, it was a pretty evening, and I was uh, sitting out on the porch. The dogs were running around out there. And Joe and Jake, all three dogs were looking back to the to the west. I mean to the east. And <laughs> oh my okay. they, they, they were all three of them looking back to the east. And um all three of them had their hackles up. And all of a sudden, Joe and Jake turned around. Here they come back up on the porch next to me. And they're both sitting out there. Like, Neefy, the puppy, well, she's she's about, uh, she was a year old in February, so that'd make her, make her about 15 months old now. She's still standing out there with the hackles up, and she starts woofing. Woof! Woof, you know. And, yeah. And she started woofing with her big girl bark. 
And all of a sudden, from over there, out of this grove of trees that Greg's heard me talk about a lot of stuff coming and going out of, an 800 to 1,000 pound dog barked back. <laughs> Unbelievable loud. I've never heard anything like it. You could go to the biggest rock concert that you've ever seen or heard of, gather all the speakers up, stack them in a huge pile, crank all the amps wide open as loud as they'll go, and it wouldn't have been any louder. And played a, an ungodly dog bark through them, and it wouldn't have been any louder than what we heard. Scared the crap out of me. Uh, unbelievable. And of course, I had no nothing going that I could have recorded it on. I've, you could have heard this clear as bell on my on a cell phone, but it's just that one, about a five second long string of ultra loud, ultra deep, unbelievably gutter rough barking. Needless to say, Niffy shut up, got her butt on the porch, and wanted in the house. Uh, I've never heard anything like it before or since. I don't know if I had a dog man out there, a monstrous size dog man, or if I had an alpha booger out there imitating a dog barking, which they can do very well. All I know, there was something out there that, uh, there was something out there. Well, have you seen any other evidence that it might be anything besides a booger? Nope, have not. Have not. But it, but it barked like a dog. It barked like a, it sounded. It barked like a dog, except enormously louder and deeper, and very, very guttural. And I've heard a lot of stuff over the years, but I've never heard anything like this, even remotely similar to it. Hmm. And there had been a lot of dogs barking all around. And I'm talking about I can I can hear dogs barking uh, a half a, almost a half a mile away easy from from my house there. Everything shut up. It was utterly, totally quiet as far as you could hear. And this thing was uh, uh, was in a hollow, and the sound just reverberated everywhere. Yeah. It was at the mouth of a hollow or at the, the upper end. And you can actually hear dogs barking all the way across the lake, you know, a mile and a half, mile and three quarter away from, from my place. And even across the lake, it was dead quiet. Uh, I've, I've never heard anything like it. So whatever it was, it just shut everything down all around. Everything. You. Everything. It shut down everything. And it stayed that way for 30 minutes. I walked in the house. and I already had a Glock on me. I walked in the house and got my 12-gauge uh, assault shotgun loaded up with uh, uh, those uh, Brennicky Special Forces Magnum slugs that'll blow a hole through half-inch A500 steel plate. It'll stop a semi. And I sat out there. I just, of course, my house is lit up like an airport land runway. <laughs> Greg's seen it. And uh, uh, I just sat out there. On, I turned off the lights on the porch so that all the floodlights were shining out into the yard and down, and down in the field. And I sat out there for about another hour. Never. Never saw anything else. Never, never. Now, Joe and Niffy were in the house. Old Jake stayed out there with me. But uh, never saw or heard anything else. <laughs> How long ago was that? How long last, ago? Last week. Oh, oh. Then the You're... next night, I heard something sound like a screaming woman. But it was moving. First, I heard it. It was out to the west. Then I heard it, it was to the west-northwest, and it moved from 
it crossed several people's properties and it ended up back at our northwest corner all the way back next to the lake which is a about a mile and a half away from my my house and and it covered that amount of ground fast and again everything uh got quiet but it i heard it scream uh four or five times and it was covering hundreds of yards in between uh the you know vocalizations actually it was covering over a quarter of a mile or more between vocalizations it was moving yeah around. boogers boogers sometimes terrorize the neighbors yes there's a lot of them that know they're there but they care to ignore they don't want to really know what's really there they just say yeah there's weird things going on but but you know i ain't going out there messing with it how long have you had that going on like to where you you kind of worry about it maybe being something different other than boogers around your house just this year i had never i had never seen a dog man until um uh, back in the uh, winter and i saw one about um, it was walked out into the road, fixing across the road as I was coming around a curve, and it um, <laughs> stopped and it back went back down into a <laughs> little creek bed, and I slowed down, and um, and I had my I had my driving I call them my ditch lights, my fog lights on, and um, they shine really good down into the sides. I slowed way down, and I got up there. The damn thing was standing there, and it had his ears pinned back and had his teeth bared growling at me. I said, I best just move on. So I did. I went back a few days later, and Jimmy Osborne went with me. and We found where it was, and we figured it had to have been about nine feet tall for me to see where, see it the way I saw it. Uh that's the only one I've ever seen. I've seen a lot of tracks and things like that. And um, that's the only one I've ever laid eyes on. But this was about, as a crow flies, about eight miles from the farm. Uh, and, and, I know, and you are 100% positive you were looking at something that was oh, yeah. like a damn dog man. Oh, absolutely. It had a, it was uh, a big... A big canine head. Uh, I mean, I was astounded how big this son of a gun's head was. I gotta ask: Does yeah. it look like the what the werewolves that a lot of you know what I mean? Like, okay, because it didn't look it didn't look like any, man, <laughs> I'm thinking like I know. hate to say it, but it looks like some of the it looks similar, very similar to some of the pictures of. Um, Look very similar to some of the pictures that I've seen, artist renditions I've seen of the base of LBL. The head was wider across the top than I thought it would have been. Yeah. And it, uh, were the ears on the top or on the sides? Uh, yes. Yeah. Like the, the, ears were ears were back. Straight. the ears were laid back. No, oh. the ears were not like that. They were pinned pinned back against the side of its head it but it reminded head. me a lot of <laughs> reminded me a lot of uh, my present german shepherd joe which is he's got a little bit of husky or malamute in him and my my german shepherd Bo, who was actually a russian bred shepherd they call him an eastern european shepherd so the wide uh, the wide it, it had a, it was, the head was wider across the top it's what, what we used to call it. You see a dog like that, you call him churn head or biscuit head, you know. What about the muzzle? Was the muzzle longer? Was it wider? It was different. It was sort of in between a German Shepherd's muzzle and, and like my dog Joe's muzzle. It was sort of a in between. Joe's muzzle is more, more round and shorter, like a husky yeah. Yeah. or a Malamute. But it didn't have the big Roman nose like old Jake has got. It was, uh, but it, uh, I guess proportional. It was a, you know, it was a long muzzle, but not super long. And it had its lips 
it was baring its teeth at me, and it had some god awful canines. Uh, and the eyes were when the lights were hitting its eyes, the eyes were glowing yellow, reflecting yellow. Um, that was pretty creepy looking. And uh, like I said, that's the only one I've ever seen. I only saw it for about. I saw it when it was coming up out of the creek bed onto the shoulder of the road, and when my lights hit it, I had the high beams on, it lit it up full height, and it real quickly went back down the way it came, and I thought it was going to be gone, but I stomped on the brakes and slowed down. Kurt Moses is on here. Stop changing I, the subject, Spencer. We're in the middle of the I will change. I will change the subject <laughs> and, uh, if I can to get off of this. You keep yeah. going, Combo. I'm listening. Any, anyway, uh, uh, it went back the way it came, and I slowed way down. And and I, when you got it, when the my truck's on high beam, it shuts off the ditch lights. So I flipped it down on low beam, which to let the light shine down into the side really good. And I eased up there, and I and I leaned up. And I was looking over there, and holy crap, there the damn thing was, standing there snarling at me. You think that's why it had its ears laid down? Oh, it, hell yeah. You know what I mean? Like, just... Oh, hell yeah. Because I, I slowed way down. I mean, I was rolling past it at a damn idle. Oh. And, uh, and I damn near rolled the freaking window down. <laughs> I what is wrong with you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, when, you, when, you, when you're out there, you do things that you don't plan on doing. And, and, and the crap gets in the fan. You know, you do things that you didn't, <laughs> didn't, you don't ever plan on doing it. You know, you think like to think that you're going to be more objective and you're going to hang in there. And that's why I, can, I don't know how in the world Bill White did the stuff he did. That man had some cojones, let me tell you. And uh, in there, laying in that little old converted uh, not a cargo trailer, a little util, a little covered over utility trailer, and the damn thing grabbing a hold of it and shaking it back and forth, and and he's in there riding it out. <laughs> <laughs> Bronco Bill. <Man>. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure he wasn't doing that. But, <laughs> right. But he didn't have a whole lot of choice because he had to he had to get out of there to get to his truck. <laughs> but. He's probably hoping that the thing ain't got a can opener or something. <laughs> ain't got a big P, booger size P38 to you know, un, un, open it up. A, Peel a it pack, like a can of sardines. You know, you know if, if the things can knock and move, you know, fifth wheel trailers and everything. I mean, there are still some of us that go out and sleep in like tarps and hammocks and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it ain't going to make no difference. If they want you there, they're going to get you if they well, really want you. I was talking back, this is back in the uh, in the 90s. I was talking to some guys that were loggers up in Alaska. And they were telling me about this is the first time I ever heard about the trees broken off and jammed down on the ground upside down with their roots, yeah. root ball up there. Except these were trees that were like three feet in diameter. Ooh. And they're 60 feet. They're jammed down the ground and 60 feet of them sticking up out of the ground with the roots up in the air. They were, they were logging off a uh, mountainside up there in on some federal property. They came to a point up on the side of this mountain. They said they were not very far up the mountain. They were, but they were well above any swamps and bogs and stuff like that. They were maybe a quarter of the way up. And they came across a line of these. And they just stopped. It was the end of the day. They stopped. They left a D8 caterpillar dozer with the big forestry cover over it. The hood, yeah. Sitting up there. Came back the next day and the son bitch had been rolled over on his side and rolled down the mountain. Wow. We're talking about something that weighs what, Greg, forty thousand pounds? A D eight. A D eight cat. Yeah. Holy yeah, probably probably closer to sixty thousand, I would guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
and they found enormous tracks where obviously a, you know it took two or three of them to do it, but they found enormous tracks pushed down into the ground. They found huge handprints and stuff on it, and they decided they'd go log somewhere else. Well, now you do know I've I've heard it said on several shows before that they used to take machinery and turn the trees upside down in the swampy, boggy areas to signify Correct. don't don't cross here. So, so it's important that what you're talking about, and also maybe That's I heard it, maybe I heard it from you, or maybe I heard it from somebody else, but. I, I thought on one of those things right up there in that in that area that you're talking about. It wasn't just one tree; it was like it was several. a line of them. Yeah, yeah he said yeah. there was a line of them. Yeah, and it went down the side of this mountain. And he said yes that they would do that to denote bogs and places that they shouldn't go. Right. And we wondered way back then if this was something a learned behavior that they had seen us doing, so they decided to use it as a as a warning for us but i do know this you know we'll find x's and stuff like that out in the woods and tps and stuff mm -hmm. and i think those are done as much probably more often for other boogers yeah but pretty universally credible stories that i've heard where they have found these trees like that and somebody's gone past that it wasn't good Hmm. And the first one I ever heard found like that in our part of the country, east of the Mississippi River, Mark Maychak found one in a research area he had, not in the LBL, but in Kentucky. He found one where he had been in there that morning looking around. He went and ate lunch and he came back and where he had parked his car there was a tree jammed down into the shoulder of the road, upside down. He tried to pull it up. And he couldn't budge it. He got some buddies of his that worked for the road department. They came out. They had to use, hook up the chain and everything that they use for pulling road signs when they relocate them. And it was two feet of that tree trunk jammed down and through the shoulder of the road. And... He said later on he found another one back in the woods about 250 yards. And uh, he quit going into that area, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong. Well, you know, but, I mean, some of the people that write stuff like that off where they just, you know, discredit it. If you consider how much force it would take, I mean, even to push a tree that's six inches in diameter. To push it down in the ground, I mean, it's one thing to pull it out, but to push it down in the ground, if if there's no way for heavy equipment to get in there or no signs of it, right? I mean, I'd, I'd like to know, you know, how many people, what do you do? Do you dig a hole and shove it down in the ground yeah. two feet and then fill it back in? And even yeah. then, it would come out fairly easy. Yeah. I'm just saying that whenever they find these things where they're shoved in the ground, I mean, that's uh -huh. a... It, it takes some force to do that. Yeah. And, you know, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, they do these things that we can't even. Oh, you've seen the pictures, my pictures of the, uh, the hardwood trees that they tore apart down in Mississippi. Haven't you? That looked the like they that... blew, them, blew them apart with dynamite, looks like. <laughs> The one that people peed on? <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's exactly what we did. We yeah. went in as Harry, we'd been going in there and researching. We came in there one evening and and there's these three trees. I'm talking about hardwood trees. They've been twisted off about seven feet above the ground. And then the things and then what and the rest of the tree thrown down across the road. And I'm not talking about little trees, I'm talking about trees that were eighteen inches or so in diameter, one of them. And the other two were like 12 to 15 inches thrown down across the road. Well, we went on in there anyway. And coming out, we just decided that, uh, 
hey, let's just see, let's let's put our mark on these trees and just one of these trees and see what happens. So uh, there were five of us, and we went over there and plus Bo, <laughs> and all five of us. Everybody peed on, pissed on the peed, tree. Peed on, peed on the tree. You know, the big stop of the tree still standing up there, you know, seven feet of it. And um, all of us did it. And then Bo contributed his part. I came back down there several days later. And it scared me so bad. It was after dark. It scared me so bad. I spun around and got the hell out of Dodge. And uh, it looked, that thing was torn to shreds. And you could see teeth marks in the wood and, and claw marks and stuff. And that thing was torn to pieces. I mean, it looked, like, it looked like somebody tied sticks of dynamite to it and blown it apart. A tree trunk was torn apart. Yes. I've got pictures of that. Yeah. I, I had that posted on the ABRF site for years. And uh, um, one of these days we need to get a, come up with some way that I can show pictures and stuff during some of these, during you, one of these shows. You can, you can, you can, you can do it now, but it'd take you a minute to figure out how. Yeah. That, well, if, if we ever do one again, I'll show you how to do it. You can do it straight from your computer where you just uh, yeah. show it on the screen. We need to do that sometime. I've got some you stuff. You're better there. at it than I am. Last time I tried to share a picture with Spencer, I was like 30 minutes and still never got it uploaded. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I've got some on this computer right here and I've got over here in the thing. I got damn four thumb drives. It's got a bunch of them on it. So, but, uh, I've I got, swear, I've got I, a absolutely fantastic picture of the of a damn little man little person looking up out really of oh heck yeah lady what greg you don't do little men you don't do the <laughs> little <people? laughs> boogers regular boogers i draw the line i don't want no dog man i don't know guy i don't want no bitty munchkins leprechauns dangling around uh-uh no i'm out on all that well i don't do i don't do the little people either but this picture was sent to me by from a really good researcher up in a, uh, I don't, I, she lives up in Minnesota or Wisconsin or something like that. They were on an expedition up there in Minnesota, and she just, she just uh, had a had a feeling they were being watched, and she just turned around, and started snapping pictures, and by golly, one of them caught one of those little buggers looking up out of the out of a bunch of vegetation. It wasn't turning. It wasn't turning its head, but it's got his. It's, it's looking like he's got his eyes cut at him. And uh, and what's really crazy? My great grandmother and my grandmother would talk about the little people sometimes, and <laughs> they would say that the thing would decorate themselves up with foliage, and this thing's got some kind of a vine or something over its head. <laughs> And uh, what are you doing? Right, UFO, UFO. <laughs> Only if he was in a backpack, Joe. <laughs> look, look, look at Sandy contributing. Yeah, hey, I'll just show it. Sandy's joining the club. Look at see the light, every, I put the light behind every, the just spotlighting him. That's what it was. She's yeah. emphasizing. Everybody say hi to Sandy. <laughs> oh, no. Sandy. No. Look at that. <laughs> uh oh. They're coming to get us. <laughs> hey, hey, go go put go put that on a speaker and stick it outside the door right now. No, let's, no. You have stuff over <laughs> no, 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 let's, let's, let's don't minute. put that on speaker outside. They don't like that. Yeah, you'll have stuff. Hey, Greg, on the wall. Greg is serious. No, they don't like stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, when he, what I should have done is brought my studio monitors down here and put on some Led Zeppelin playing out there down the hall. I was just I was just getting ready to say, didn't you say they hated Led Zeppelin? Oh, they hate Led Zeppelin. <laughs> they especially hate when the levee breaks. Yeah. 
and, uh, and there's several other ones they can't stand. And uh, they 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 can't stand uh, Van Halen. Like uh, I can't stand Van what's, Halen. What's the what's the one he does? Uh, meltdown or breakdown or something? It start a pretty woman. No, not pretty women. It's uh, well, yeah, they don't like that either. That lead into pretty women. And, <laughs> they don't like and, that uh, one either. Yeah, right. there's there's a bunch of big, lot, good, loud, screaming guitar riffs that they, they don't like. And, uh, they're prob they're probably not Stevie Ray yeah, Vaughan fans then. I found that found that out back when I was in fact in the 70s when I was down at Auburn. <laughs> no, try some Jimi Hendrix. They would hate Jimi Hendrix. I've never tried Jimi Hendrix on them, but yeah, there's some Jimi Hendrix that they wouldn't like. Yeah, yeah eruption. <laughs> yeah, somebody Jody J is eruption is uh is the uh Van Halen they can't stand. Go play Voodoo Child real loud and see what yeah. happens. <laughs> Red House. Uh, <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne, Crazy Train. That's another one they don't like. And uh I got screamed at out at the farm playing Crazy Train one one night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had it in my truck and I was out there had to had the uh windows down. I had that dude cranked up, man, and and uh, he, uh, do what? No, nah, it wasn't. Yeah, when the levee breaks, it is genius. There's some drum licks in there. It took them years to figure out how they did them. But anyway, that's enough of that stuff. <laughs> uh, wait, I just, wait. I, 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 I got one. I got one question on that. Since you're the one that brought up the loud sounds and everything. Yeah. On the show far, on the show far thing, which is like. People are talking about it now, like it's common knowledge. You and you and Mark, I think, were the first people I, I ever heard that for decades. Right. Mm -hmm. With with the shofar, and you guys use the bigger one. Yeah. Do you think? And I really don't because it'd be a whole other show if we go into the the whole mystical magical things that are tied into this. But yeah. Is there any chance that it's just the sound resonance, that it's just the the vibrational factor of that sound that it drives them crazy, and maybe that's why they react the way that they do to it? Or do you think it's more than that? It's different than that because in the Bible it says that in some places and in some other ancient writings that we found that the Nephilim are compelled they're compelled to respond or answer to the voice of God. When we got to digging and digging and digging, we found out the voice of God was not God speaking. It was a it was an object. And it took us a long time to figure out a lot of research to figure out that the voice of God is a specific type of shofar. Okay. And so once we check, figure that out, and it took me a while to find one that I could afford, but I did. So then I start getting out there and blowing it and everything, nothing. <laughs> nothing. I thought, well, here we just spent five or six years trying to figure out about a, the voice of God. And they have telling how many hours Mark and I talked about it. How many hours did the two of us put in offline, you know, out digging around and stuff and comparing notes and talking to biblical scholars and and experts on ancient texts and stuff, ancient Hebrew and crap. And I finally get a hold of this guy up in upstate New York. And he says, the trouble is you're not blowing it right. So he wouldn't just come out and tell me. He'd give me little hints. It took another two years of experimenting and stuff to finally figure out what this thing could do and get an idea of what I should try. And when I finally got an idea of what I should try, we went up to 
myself and some guys went up to Iowa and I finally, finally was able to to do what I was wanting to do with it in the woods. And I'd been down there trying for 30 minutes and couldn't hit the right notes. I finally hit it. And the woods erupted. We had three different groups set up of them screaming at us from three directions. And all of a sudden we realized some of the guns were coming at us wide open as hard and fast as they could. What's really crazy, uh, y'all have heard me talk about this, we had a pack of coyotes run out of the woods out into the road in front of us and came towards us and hunkered down and laid down in the road in front of us. The whole freaking pack. And they were terrified. They were doing like this, you know, you know, like they were terrified that something was fixing to get them. And they were coming to us for protection from the boogers that were coming in fast. And they came in and just stopped and stood around there for 30 minutes or so, over a half hour, just sitting there like that, you know, and they got close enough that they could see us. They did not interact with the other other troops at all. None. They did not acknowledge the presence of the other troops. They just sit there watching us. And finally, they just sort of, well, we came here for this. And they turned around and walked off. So, And after they were well and truly gone, the coyotes got up and trotted off down the roads and off the woods they went. So literally like they were almost summoned. Yes. They they were summoned. I've tried it in Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Texas, Tennessee. Uh, and that is, prob- that is probably and more dangerous where, oh, than a lot of Alabama, people realize. Alabama. Everywhere I've tried it, the exact same thing has happened. They come in, when they hear it, they come in as hard and fast as they can. They come in until they can see us, and then they stop. And The problem is that I have no idea why they're, why they're coming, what they're expecting when they get there. And that's why I've quit doing it. Because well, I figure that if I keep doing it, the odds are that I'm going to piss one of them off, that we're going to do something wrong. And we're yeah. going to be the ones that they find out there with the heads gone. Yeah. And and like like Cans just pointed out, a lot of people, now that it's out there in the Bigfoot world, a lot of people are attempting to do it. And in my opinion, y'all are nuts for messing with something that you yep. don't understand. And it's only a matter of time before something bad happens from that, yep. from people messing around with things that they they don't know exactly what they're doing. You're speaking a whole right. different language, and you don't right. know what you're saying. That's exactly correct, and that's why I have not touched that thing in a in, a, in at least a year, in over a year. And I I know it works. I know it brings them in, but I don't know what they're expecting when they get there. Yeah. And that's why I, per, I, I I believe now, to me, that's convincing evidence that somehow Bigfoot have some connection with the Nephilim. Whether they are Nephilim, I don't think so, but I think they're descendants of them or got enough Nephilim blood in them that they are compelled to respond to the summons of the voice of God. I watched him blow that thing one night. Me, him, Jimmy Osmer, and, and my buddy Alan. We was up here on the river. He blew that thing, and next thing we knew, there was a bugger screen, and it sounded like it was five, six hundred yards. It wasn't what was it? A couple of it wasn't a minute. Next time that thing yelled, it was four hundred yards, and then it wasn't just another minute or so. It sounded like it was three hundred yards. And it was like, y'all, it's it's probably gonna be time to get out of here. That thing's not happy, and he is coming hard. Yeah, yeah. It was actually it's 
document. I mean, it was actually a shorter amount of time than that. He he was coming in, and there we were out on a peninsula, sticking out into the river. <laughs> a really, really, really wise place to be. Were you in a hovercraft? No. <laughs> uh, Greg and I just about made hovercrafts out of our trucks, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> and what, and what was, was funny? It was this good old boy had come roaring into the into the area. We went off and left him there. <laughs> we got down the road about what about a half a mile, and we stopped. There was a bunch of we'd had a big storm. There was a bunch of trees that blown down the road. We pulled off. We were going to be good. We were going to be good. You get our chains out, pull those trees out of the <laughs> road, and all of a sudden here we hear that truck flying <laughs> towards us. He hits those tree trunks. And he never let up. <laughs> he jumped. What, five tree trunks, Greg, that were down on the road? Four. He hit the first one. I don't know how it kept from tearing the whole front end out from under that truck. But he he went airborne and came across it. And I think what happened was, after we left, he said, there, well, I ran them boys off. And uh, about that time, that booger came busting out of the brush. In it right in his lap. Uh, and uh <laughs> Greg, 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 what'd you say a lot can happen when you're properly motivated or oh, highly oh, motivated? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, you can get you can get highly motivated. You'd be surprised what you can do when you are highly motivated because fear is a motivator. Uh that old boy's truck, like Tim said, they we're not talking about little big trees. I'm talking about these trees laying fell across the road, they were knee high. I mean, there's four trees, like two of them was laying right beside each other, and there's a little gap about a couple of feet, and then two more real close. That dude was in a three-quarter ton Dodge diesel, like Cummins diesel pickup, extended right. cab, jacked up. He hit that first tree, and I'm not, I could have walked under the truck. I'm six one. I could have walked under the middle of his truck and not bumped my head when he cleared them trees and come down. And y'all, he never let out of the damn throttle. That thing, when it went in the air, it revved up and wow! And when it hit the ground, he was swirling sideways. I thought he's gonna take out Tim's truck, my truck, y'all. That old boy, he come out of there like he was on fire. <laughs> so, so, we... so, somebody tell Kumbo he's muted again. <laughs> y'all just leave your mics unmuted and let's see what happens. Well, well, we decided we were gonna try to run him down and see what he saw. We couldn't catch him. <laughs> we couldn't we even see his tail light. No. No. I mean, he was he was gone. And we knew the road because we don't we just drove it in on it. And just just give it a year or two and he'll be on one of these YouTube shows. He might be y'all that was that was a freaky night. That was the same night I nearly watched Evil Knievel over here and nearly turn his truck over. <laughs> yeah. I kid. He liked to run Jimmy Osmer up through the timber. I, I didn't know whether to worry about him or Jimmy. I didn't, they, he drove across, Tim drove across a culvert that it come a bad storm and it, it flooded. It washed the culvert out and you couldn't tell it. I'm following his truck. He's in this new truck and had it long. We're driving around through there at about 30, 35 mile an hour. Next thing I know, his truck, the front pasture side dips down and like it just pulls him off the highway. In the driver's side rear tire, I could have walked up. I mean, like, it would have been high as my head. The truck just tips over, and it's going toward the woods. And all of a sudden, I, Mario Andretti whooped her back up in the highway. They ain't one out of 500 people could have pulled that pickup back up in the road. And how he did it, I, I reckon the Lord just shoved his truck back in the highway. I tell folks, in my lifetime, I know I've worn out four or five squadrons of Guardian Angels. <laughs> what saved me though, no kidding, is that truck that trail ball truck of mine has an all wheel drive position. And and I had it automatic all wheel drive. If I'd have had it standard four wheel, we'd have that truck would have rolled over on the side the bottom of that ditch. No, I ain't kidding. This ditch the slope was forty five degree angle in in the yep. timber. Yep. And he didn't have a long way to do it. And how in the world it didn't turn plumb over? I have no idea. Somebody's watching out for you yeah. for sure. 
it, yeah, it, even, it was pretty crazy. Even the truck was highly motivated. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Yeah. Like I said, fear is what motivated. Was you driving a Chevy? <laughs> yeah. I, of course, I drove for like nine years before I ever drove on a plane road. I, I remember very well the first time I drove on a plane road. I was terrified. Because <laughs> the only thing I knew how to do was slide around, you know, and yeah. <laughs> drift through curves and everything. <laughs> and I thought mm -hmm. I, I, really, I, I didn't know what I was going to do when I had to drive on a plane road the first time. Yeah, it grips a little bit, don't it? <laughs> yeah. I was afraid I was going to turn over. No more yeah. drifting. <laughs> well, Spencer, well, I think I think tonight's been a wonderful show. I hate Mark and Larry missed out, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I really hate that for them. Don't worry. They're off in the woods somewhere trying to stream this right now, and it's probably spotty signal, and they missed half of the good parts, and they'll have to yeah. come back and watch it, and I'll get that many more views. <laughs> yeah. I hate we had to keep you muted most of the night. <laughs> I thought I've been in there soaking it, it like in. It's I mean, hey. been okay, but <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, it's probably for the best because you know it, we're waiting till Sunday, Misty. Me and you waked up Sunday. I'll, I'll be in live chat. Yeah. I'll the stir it up in the live chat. I've been somebody's done asking. <laughs> I, I can't tonight. That's the thing that kills me is like when I'm on here, I can't see the live chat, so I'm missing out on all the good stuff. I mean, it it's awesome because man, you know, I now look, I, they 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 done wonderful tonight. I mean, look, Joe and Billy and Cashew and all them, they've been posting some good questions. So, with well, comments, I don't know what you'll phrase some of that as questions, some of it's got a dog Spencer comments. So, hey, and and Squirrel, Squirrel and I are coming off of two shows in a row that we had to behave ourselves last yeah. night and tonight. Sunday, Sunday, it's wide open. Sunday, it's going to be vicious. Sunday, we're just talking about like hunting and barbecue because I'm scared it'll go back into the dog man field. I it's, can't. I don't know how you've made it tonight. Well, they they've been at least an hour of this worth I, of dog man. I, I was. I was highly medicated. I knew what was yeah. going on. Look, you're, you're having, not, I'm calling it right now, Spencer Jameson's having nightmares and he's peeing the bed. <laughs> <I guarantee. laughs> I, I still got some leftover puppy pads. I'm going to put them down for <laughs> week tonight. Uh, wow. Well, y'all, both y'all, thank you very much for coming on tonight. Uh, you know, Please I mean, I can't. <laughs> I can't say Both no more. Both y'all got to come to Alabama is all I know. We'll, Not we'll at the same on. time. <laughs> well, no, we probably couldn't. It'd just be an overdose, you know. No, I'll kill her and we'll use her as bait. Yeah, right off. You don't know what I told you I'd do to you. <laughs> I told you I, she, I think like Kumo, I don't want to be the last one. So, hey, I'll she threatens me else. constantly <laughs> offline. I think she means it. Oh. Um, anyway. Hey, guys, seriously. Thank you very much. Uh, hold on backstage for one second after we get off here just so I can uh, tell you goodbye. But uh, to everybody that watched tonight, thank you very much. Hope you had a good time. I mean, I thought it was excellent. And, whoo, we got overloaded on some kind of information. But uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, we did. But anyway, see you all on Sunday, providing I can find somebody else. Probably won't top this, but we'll find somebody. Anyway, see y'all. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye. Good Bye. night. Bye.